Well, good evening, hearth and homies. Oh man, it's like starting to come down. <laughs> Glad I'm in here with this uh, nice warm fire. Thanks for joining us for tonight's compilation, Father Knows Best. From 1949 to 1953, audiences tuned in to NBC to catch the adventures of Jim Anderson, played by Robert Young. June Whitley played his wife, Margaret, and the show revolved around the uh, antics of typical suburban American family. Jim Anderson was an agent for General Insurance in the town of Springfield, which represented an average Midwest town. He and Margaret had three children, Betty, Bud, and Kathy. Actor Robert Young would become the epitome of the warm, caring father figure. In fact, when the show moved to television, Young was the only actor from the radio show that continued on. We've taken this classic old-time radio show and paired it with videos of beautiful scenery for a unique old-time radio viewing experience. So sit back and enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Ladies and gentlemen, from time to time, radio programs of vastly individual and divergent types are presented to advertising agencies sponsors, and the broadcasting networks, each of them striving to achieve a definite and conclusive effect. There is, for example, the mystery show. <laughs> Programs of this sort are presented for thrills, suspense, intrigue. Then there's the comedy show. Hey, Louie, here's one that'll kill you. Why did the chicken cross the aisle? You give up? Because it was a cross-style chicken! <laughs> Programs of this sort are presented for laughs, for rib-tickling mirth, for genial good fellowship. The program you are about to hear, Father Knows Best, starring the eminent actor, Mr. Robert Young, is presented for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> an average town, Springfield, on an average street, Maple, lives an average American family, the Hendersons. The husband, Jim, is very much in love with his wife, Margaret, and they're both quite fond of their three children, Betty, Bud, and Kathleen, which I should say is an average way for parents to feel. On this particular morning, which is an average sort of day, the Hendersons are ready for an average sort of meal, breakfast. Well, they're supposed to be ready, but you know how it is. The average mother calls... Jim! Your breakfast is on the table. And the average answer is... Mother, I can't find my cake. Kathleen, come in and start your breakfast. Oh, breakfast. Don't you understand, Mother? This is a crisis. How can I go to school without my skates? Eat your breakfast, dear, and we'll look for the skates later. Oh, but I have looked for them. I've looked just every place. They simply varnished. Vanished, Kathy. Did you look in the hall under the telephone table? Mother, that's practically the first place I looked. Well, how about the service port? They aren't there. They aren't anywhere. Oh, what am I going to do? You're going to eat your breakfast. I'll run out to the garage and see if you left them there. And don't use too much sugar on your cereal. Look way in the back, Mother, near the magazine. Oatmeal. That's all you ever get around here is oatmeal. Ah! <laughs> young lady. What about daddy? Skates. <sighs> How many times have I asked you not to leave your skates on the stairs? Oh, is that where they were? Oh, oh golly. I looked simply everywhere and I couldn't find them. Good morning, dear. Did you have a nice... Jim, what did you do to your chin? I came down the stairs on it. <laughs> what did you see? Oh, Jim, your poor chin. Isn't it wonderful, Mother? Daddy fell down the stairs and found my skate. I did not fall down the stairs. Please, Jim, hold still. How can I fix your I will chin not have you... that child telling people I fell down the stairs. I tripped over her confounded skates. Is that the only place she can find to leave them? Well, she's very sorry, dear, aren't you, Kathy? Hmm? Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> Daddy. Not now, Kathy. Have some coffee, Jim. It'll make you feel better. Other people have children and they have skates. But other people have discipline in their homes. Old-fashioned discipline. The kind of discipline we had in my home when I was a boy. 
There was a place for everything and Mom. everything in it. Hey, Mom. I'm sorry, dear. We'll try to do better. What is it, Bud? I can't find my other shoe. Where'd you put it? Look under the dresser. Okay. <laughs> is that where you generally put his other shoe? Sometimes. Mm. How do you want your eggs this morning, dear? Daddy, oh, I, don't care. I was just wondering. Kathy, this think... is a very bad time to bother your father. We'd better let it go for a while. Uh, shall I scramble them, Jim? Oh, yeah, it's important, not... Mother. It's the most important thing in my life. What is? It's really nothing, dear. All it's... right, Kathy, stop looking like Ingrid Bergman and tell me what it is. <laughs> I need two dollars, Daddy. I'm desperate. Two dollars? What for? Wings. What did she say, Margaret? She said wings. That's what I thought. <laughs> Why does she need wings? I have to be an angel. I told them I would. I just have to be. And they cost two dollars. It's the school play, dear. Kathleen said she'd be an angel. Well, I can see they're certainly not casting the type. <laughs> uh, Kathy, you get an allowance, don't you? If you can call it that, a quarter. Hmm. When I was nine years old, I had to work for every penny I got. I couldn't walk up to my father and say, I want two dollars for wings. <laughs> Were you an angel? I most certainly was not. Well, then, you didn't need wings. But I promised I'd be an angel. All right, then find a way to sprout wings without my two dollars. Oh, but, Daddy, I'll be just ruined. Oh, Mother, can't We won't you... discuss it any further, Kathy. Your father knows best. How will I face them without wings? <laughs> they were counting on me. Morning, everybody. How's it? What happened to the squirt? Oh, just a minor tragedy. Drink your orange juice, Bud. Say, Dad, I was just thinking... Bud, not now. Let your father read the paper. But I was just going to tell not him about... Not now, dear, please. Well, but I have to. Gosh, how much time have I got left? You don't mind if I get in on this, do you? <laughs> how much time for what? Well, Dad, we're going on a picnic tomorrow. A whole bunch of us. Fine, have a good time. He can go on picnics. And I can't even have wings. Mm. You treat me like an orphan around here. Nobody even loves me. Oh, Kathy, stop being dramatic. Everyone loves you. Sure, but not two dollars worth. <laughs> Kathleen, your brother's not asking for two dollars. Your brother's not asking for anything. Except permission to use the car. Except permission to use... <laughs> Except what? Well, well, that's what I was going to ask you about. You see, we're, we're all going out in the country, and I told everybody... You're not going to use the car. Well, but, Dad, if I don't, how am I going to go? You have a bicycle, haven't you? <laughs> when I was your age, I was traveling all over the state on my bicycle. With a girl? How can I, how can I take a girl on a bicycle? Jim, I just thought One moment, that... Margaret. James Henderson, Jr., you are 15 years of age, and young men 15 years of age do not go traipsing around the country with girls in my car. But everybody else does, Dad. I mean, they get to use their father's car. Joe Phillips uses his father's car, and he's two months younger than I am. I wouldn't care if he was three months younger and had wings. <laughs> you may not have the car. But you know your father doesn't approve of children driving automobiles. Children? If I want the car, I'm too young. If I want to go to the circus, I'm too old. I wish somebody around here would decide how old I am. We've decided you're too young. Now, that'll be all of that. I'll be an outcast. That's what I'll be. I'll be poisoned with every hunk of date bait in the school. <laughs> Me and a bicycle. But you better eat your eggs before they get ice cold. What a time to think about eggs. Dad, how would it be if No. I... But I was just going to... No. But you don't even know... No. Whatever it is, no. Oh, fine. The way I'm treated around here, you'd think I was an orphan. Copycat. I said it first. Quiet, squirt. Kathy, leave your brother alone and finish your milk. But I did say it first, didn't I, Daddy? I said it first and Bud heard me, and he's an old copycat. I am not. I wasn't even listening to you. You were, too. You heard me say it, and then you said it, and you're an old copycat. I am not. You are so. I am not. You are so. Quiet, both of you, quiet. Oh, Margaret, why can't we ever have a peaceful breakfast in this house? I'm sorry. I don't yeah. think it's asking an awful lot. When I was a boy, we had wonderful breakfasts, quiet breakfasts, peaceful breakfasts. We had respect for our elders. Sure, but you didn't have a kid sister like the brat. I'm not a brat. You're a brat if I ever saw one. I am not. You are so. I am not. You are so. Quiet! Good morning, Mother. Good morning, Father. What's the matter with her? <laughs> I know. I was looking out the window at a bird. It was sitting on an egg. <laughs> Yeah. 
How'd you ever tear yourself away? Dear Bud, such a lovable little moron. Betty, do you sound so strange this morning? Is anything wrong? Wrong? Oh, Mother, how can you even say that? In this lovely, wonderful world, how could anything be wrong? Hey, Pop, you better hide your wallet. This one's gonna be a pip. <laughs> Father, if you don't do something about Betty, that child... Betty, if you don't mind, I believe I can manage my family without your assistance. Kathy? Yes, Daddy? As your father, I'm quite capable of handling my own financial affairs. It may be a strain, but I can manage. Yes, Daddy? And I would prefer that even in moments of stress, you refrain from addressing me as, Hey, Pop. <laughs> okay, Daddy. Finally, I believe I am as well qualified as you to recognize the devious routes employed by your sister in leading up to the announcement that she needs a new dress. That's telling her, Pop. What? I mean, Daddy. <laughs> You're all very amusing, but I don't need a new dress. Well, dear, are you sure you feel all right? I feel fine. Betty, you, you don't want any money? No, Father. Why? You don't want to borrow the car? Of course not. Well, <laughs> at least there's one sensible child in this family... Betty, I'm proud of you. Thank you, Father. Yes, sir. What this country needs is more children who leave their fathers alone at the breakfast table. I think I'll have another cup of coffee, Margaret. All right, dear. There you are. Thank you. Well, Betty, what's the good word in your little world? Oh, just the most wonderful thing has happened, Father. I'm going to be married. Oh, yes. Yes. Hold your eyes up on your head quickly, oh. Hold on back. What for? What happened? Don't stand there. Do something. Mm. Do you want him to close this? Mm. Jim. I'm all right, actually. You're going to be fine, Ted, just fine. Well, stop beating me on the back or I'll never be all right. Oh, but Mother told me... I did me... not tell you to break your father's spine. Well, you told me to pound him. With your hand, not your books. <laughs> oh. Bud, you're going to be late for school. I get it. Come on, Kathy. Come on, where? You're going to school. I don't have to leave for ten minutes. Oh, that's what you think. Hey, stop calling me, you brute. See I you later, get everybody. Father! <laughs> All right, Betty. Now, uh, what was that newsy little item you dropped into the middle of my coffee? You? Oh, you mean about getting married. Isn't it wonderful? Margaret, did you know anything about this? Not a word, Jim. I still don't. Betty, you're joking, aren't you? Joking? Mother, do you think I joke about the most sacred thing in a woman's life? Jim, she isn't joking. <laughs> Betty, you, uh, wouldn't mind giving us a little more information, would you? You know, just in case we want to get in touch with you later. I don't know what you mean, Father. Well, just for start, who is it? Who's who? The boy, my prospective son-in-law. What's his name? Billy. He's wonderful. Oh, Betty, not Billy Smith. Just wonderful. Which one is he? Oh, you know, Jim, the one who hates football players, the one Betty thinks is aesthetic. Aesthetic? <laughs> The one I think it is, that's a new way of spelling anemic. <laughs> Billy is delicate. You have to be delicate if you have a beautiful soul. Well, that's exactly what this family needs, somebody with a beautiful soul. <laughs> Margaret, I have to get out of the office. Explain to Betty that she'll be happier if she waits. Make certain, you know, the usual woman-to-woman -woman talk. All right, dear. Oh, you don't have to worry about us, Father. Billy and I talked it all over last night, and we both decided against a hasty marriage. We intend to wait. That's fine. I'll be home at the usual time, dear. All right, Jim. We're if not going to be married until Saturday. If you... <laughs> Saturday? Uh-huh. Saturday night. We were going to make it in the afternoon, but we decided to go to the basketball game first. <laughs> this is an emergency. Put your hat down. I'll put more than my hat down. Betty, this is the most ridiculous piece of conversation I've ever heard. Father, you mean you don't approve? Now, there's the first intelligent remark you've made since you've got up. I most decidedly don't approve. But I don't understand. You've always liked Billy's father. You mean Hector Smith? Of course I like Hector Smith. He's one of my best clients. Why don't you marry him? <laughs> but he is married. Betty, your father and I have always thought Just a moment, you... Margaret. I'll handle this. Betty, you're 17 years of age. You're in your first year at the university. You will not marry Billy Smith or anyone else until after your graduation. That's final. Graduation? But that's three and a half years. I'll be over 21. Why, why, the best years of my life will be gone. Well, darling, we can always have Bud push you up to the altar in a wheelchair. <laughs> You're laughing.
laughing at me. I think you're horrid. You're just old-fashioned, both of you. You've forgotten what it is to be young and in love. You don't seem to understand that things are different now. Oh, Betty, nothing's any different. Things like that don't change. They do, too. Things change all the time. People change, customs change, everything changes. Only you won't admit it. Oh, darling, why don't you listen to your father? Things are no different now than they were when we were your age. The young people wore different clothes and they sang different songs, but fundamentally they were the same, and even then boys and girls didn't rush headlong into marriage. Not until they were ready for it. You bet they didn't. They listened to their fathers. They were willing to benefit from a lifetime of experience. Why, when I was courting your mother, I remember when... How old were you when you married father? Well, I... Yes, mother. I was 17. But that was different. Why? (laughs) Well, because things were different in those days. The, uh... (laughs) The people were different. The times were different. You said they weren't. Well, they were. Uh, some of them were. Some of them weren't, and some of them were. Only the ones that weren't were more than the, uh... Margaret... Betty, um, don't you think it would be a nice idea if Billy and his family were to have dinner with us tonight? Oh, Mother, would you? Really? Margaret, I don't want the Smiths for dinner tonight or any other night. I think the idea of a dinner for the Smiths is not only ridiculous, but unnecessary. I forbid the marriage, and that's that. Oh, Jim, you know you like having people in for dinner. The Smiths are very pleasant, and you might be able to sell Hector some more insurance. Yeah, that's right. I might have that. <laughs> but look, Margaret, I'm going to have a tough day at the office. I couldn't take a dinner tonight. Let's make it next week. Uh, next month. Dear, we can't put it off for even a day. I'll call the Smiths and see if they can make it. Shall I tell them dinner will be at 7.30? 7.30? What's the matter with 6 o'clock? I'll be starved by 7.30. Jim, it just isn't done. Well, it's going to be done tonight. We'll have dinner at 6. I'll ask them to be prompt, dear, at 7.30. <laughs> and, and Mother, can we dress? I mean, can I wear my new dinner gown? Can I, Mother? Oh, please, can I? Betty, there will be no dressing for dinner. But, Father, I... Mother, please. I'm sorry, darling. You know, I never contradict your father. After all, your father knows best. It's been a long day for the Hendersons. The specter of a fair young child, married and gone before her time, has hung like a pall throughout the day. It would have, that is, if the Hendersons hadn't been so busy. Jim, you see, had a hectic day at the office. Six? Why, you robber, how about the two strokes in back of that tree? And don't tell me those snakes followed you over from the last hole. Uh At the office. Bud has been involved in the intricacies of a higher education. But Margie, it's healthful riding on a bicycle. What? Look at all the fresh air you'll get in, and the beautiful muscles. We could even... Margie? Hello, Margie? Hello? Kathy has been involved in serious plans for the future. What do you mean they don't take girls in the Foreign Legion? (laughs) I'll bet they do. Especially without wings. You just wait, you'll see. Margaret? Well, Margaret has been very busy cooking an extra special dinner for the Smiths. And if there's one thing Margaret can do, it's cook. Yes, sir, Margaret, if there's one thing you can do, it's cook. That's what I always say. You see? Now we can proceed. Uh, proceed. Thank you, Hector. Would you care for another piece of pie? Margaret, please. I've already had two helpings. You have three. Kathy. (laughs) Uh, How about uh, another cup of coffee, Heck? (laughs) Nothing like a cup of Margaret's piping hot coffee. Well, if you insist... Hector? I guess I'd better not, Jim. (laughs) You know how it is. Uh, Doctor's orders. Oh, sure. Well, how about you, Doctor? Uh, (laughs) Thank you, no. One cup of coffee is quite sufficient. Well, I'm a two-cup man myself. You know, I was reading just the other day... Jim, it's not that we don't enjoy your informative little talk, but I was under the impression that this dinner had, well, shall I say, a more or less definite purpose. Hmm? Oh, you mean... Oh, sure, absolutely. You know, I had a long talk with Heck before dinner... Jim, dear, I hate to interrupt, but uh, 
Don't you think it would be a good idea if Bud took Kathy to the movies? In the middle of the week? I certainly do not. I... Th- oh, I see what you mean. Uh, Bud, uh, how'd you like to take Kathy to the movies? Oh, boy! I wouldn't. I can't think of anything I'd rather do less. <laughs> well, that's fine. Here's a dollar. Have a good time. Oh, Dad, do I have to? Yes, you have to. That'll be enough of that, Kathy. But I'm surprised you ought to be glad to take your sister to the movies. I'd rather go with a gorilla. <laughs> You don't know what she's like. She never even looks at the picture. She sits around backwards and stares at the people. They're funnier. I like to look at their faces. All right, bud, get going and come home right after the show. If I'm still alive. Good night, everybody. Come on, Stuart. Hey, stop pulling me. Why do you always have to pull me? <laughs> Lovely children. They mean well, I think. Uh, Mother. Yes, Betty? Mother, Billy and I have been talking and... Billy, you tell them. Um, (laughs) uh, We... uh, Would it be all right if we went to the movies? Oh, no. Oh, I should say not. We're here for a purpose, a very definite purpose. Yes, sir. We have a problem to discuss, and we're going to do it right now. Frankly, I think the whole thing is idiotic. Imagine discussing a ridiculous subject like marriage with these... these children. We're not children, Mother. We're quite adult. We have adult minds, adult bodies, adult passions, adult... William! Elizabeth, as I said before, Hector and I had a long talk just a little while ago. Right, Heck? Right. And we're in complete agreement on the subject, right? Right. We both feel that... Open discussion is the only sensible procedure in a matter of this sort, right? Right. Hector, stop being so agreeable. Right. I I mean, yes, dear. Myron, Elizabeth, Hector and I have agreed on what we consider a very sound solution to the entire problem. We have decided to permit Betty and Bill to be married immediately. Jimmy! Holy cow! I've never heard anything so outrageous in my entire life. Hector, get your hat. William, we're leaving this instant. I'm not going, Mother. Absolutely. William! I'm 18, Mother. I've got a mind of my own. I love Betty, and we're going to be married. Well, I never... All right, now that's settled, you're going to be married. Oh, Mother, isn't it wonderful? I, I don't know. Yes, sir, nothing like marriage and responsibility to set a man straight. Uh, where do you kids figure on living? After you're married, I mean. Oh, well, uh... We sort of figured we'd move Mother, in. Mother, couldn't Kathy move in with Bud? Then Billy That's and I That's ridiculous, have Betty. You've got to have a home of your own, a place for your roots to take hold and grow. Right, Heck? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, gosh, that'd be kind of expensive. Uh, and on my allowance... Oh, uh, don't worry about your allowance, Billy. Married men don't go around taking allowances from their fathers. They don't. Of course not. They're too proud to be supported by their fathers. I'm not. (laughs) Of course you are. You'll work, you'll sweat and slave, but you'll come home every week with a juicy pay envelope for your little wife. Isn't that sweet? But I I don't know how to do anything. That's not so. Poets make a living... And, Mother, he writes the most beautiful poetry. I'm sure he does, dear. Billy, recite the one about my hair. It's just wonderful. (laughs) Oh, Betty. (laughs) Well, it is. Raven tresses on a lofty brow, swept by the winds of time. Isn't that beautiful? (laughs) Well, you could get a small house. A poet size. Say, Jim, I saw an apartment advertised the other day Be just right for the kids A uh, uh, hundred and a quarter a month, furnished Of course, that's without utilities You know, gas, electricity, telephone And food, don't forget food That's right, and laundry and cleaning Oh, they won't have to worry about that, Jim Don't you remember when we were first married I did all our laundry and cleaning and cooking I'm sure Betty will want to do at least that for Billy Won't you, dear? I guess so Betty Yes, Billy Could I talk to you for a minute? <laughs> In privately? Of course Will you excuse us, please? We'll be right back It's all right, kids Take all the time you need We're in no hurry Are, uh, are they gone? I think so 
<laughs> Jim, we did it. Yes, sir. By golly, we did it. Oh, it was nothing, really. Jim, stop looking so smug. What was nothing? The psychological attack I planned for tonight. Yeah. You see, I felt our wisest possible course, from a tactical standpoint, lay in a feint to their left flank and a drive through the middle. Do you follow me? Yes, dear. Right up to the part where you started to talk. <laughs> Margaret, the whole thing is elemental. Yes, and very clever. We pretend to give our consent. That's the feint. Believe me, I almost did. <laughs> then we hit them with both barrels. The cost of living, the struggle for existence. They retire in disorder. Their armored units are smashed. Their rear guard is demolished. What a fight. Dear, <laughs> dear, the enemy is back. Hmm? Oh, uh, come on in, kids. Everything all settled? I think so, Father. Hmm, pretty much settled, sort of. That's fine. Now, uh, what did you finally decide? You know very well what we were forced to decide. We have to wait. Why... Betty, I thought that you and Billy... Mr. Smith, you don't have to continue the ridiculous performance you and my father were putting on. Betty! Oh, Father, you can be so juvenile at times, really. A part of it's a hundred and a quarter a month. We know some kids have one for 45. You older people ought to get straightened out on the simple facts of life before you start fooling around with psychology. Jim, your mouth is open. Oh, well, uh, now see here, both of you kids... Just a I... moment, Jim. Betty, exactly what do you and Billy intend to do? Well, as long as our families are determined to exercise parental prerogatives, we'll just have to wait until we're financially self-sufficient. Right, Billy? Right. Well, I never... Well, Betty, how about how long do you figure it's going to take you and Billy to become uh, financially independent? Um, a few years. Well, <laughs> that gives us a little time to look around for a wedding present, eh, Heck? Yeah. <laughs> That's right, Jim. A couple of years, it's a long time. A lot of things can happen. Mm -hmm. Hector, how about another cup of coffee? Oh, thank you, Margaret. I think I can use one. You know, Margaret, I'm very relieved. I'm so afraid of hasty marriages. Don't mind us, Mother. Just go on talking as if we weren't here. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. It's just that I was so afraid you were going to make the same mistake I did. <laughs> Oh, I wouldn't exactly say you made a mistake, Elizabeth. Heck's a pretty nice guy. Yeah, well, thanks, Jim. Uh, you can send me a check in the morning. <laughs> I suppose I have been fairly fortunate. But, of course, people aren't always that lucky when they marry beneath them. I suppose not, but when they what? Uh, uh, Elizabeth, uh, we'd better go. It's, uh, it's getting Wait late. a minute, Heck. What I... was that crack you made, Elizabeth? Well, after all, my mother was a Stuyvesant. And I certainly... In other words, you think Betty isn't good enough for your son. I'm sure that isn't what Elizabeth meant, Jim. That's what she said. Well, isn't that what you said, Lizzie? <gasps> <laughs> Don't you dare call me Lizzie. Why not? If you can say my daughter isn't good enough for that puny excuse of a son... Now, just a minute, Jim. <laughs> writing poetry. What makes you think he's such a bargain? My boy has a fine head on his shoulders. What shoulders? <laughs> I've seen better heads on a small beer. <laughs> is that so? Yes, that's so. This is what comes from slumming. Slumming? Now you listen to me, Elizabeth Smith. Your mother may have been a Stuyvesant, but my father spent half his life picking your father out of the gutter. <laughs> and he wasn't lying down just because he was tired. <laughs> I think I'm going to faint. Hector, I'm going to faint. Go ahead, dear. I'll catch you. <laughs> you ought to be ashamed upsetting my mother with your vulgar insinuations. Vulgar? Why, you little pipsqueak. If you were my son, I'd vulgar you so hard you wouldn't sit down for a week. Fortunately, I am not your son. Peasant? Peasant? Don't you dare call my father a peasant, Billy Smith. Don't you dare. Well, that's what he is. He is not. He certainly is. Well, I'd rather be a peasant than a... Pipsqueak! Don't you call me a pipsqueak! I will if I want to. Pipsqueak! Peasant! I never want to see you again as long as I live. Well, you won't if I can help you. You're it. just an actor. Uh, just a minute, dear. Say, Jim. I, uh, sorry I lost my temper, Heck. Oh, that's all right. Say, uh, Jim, that, uh, that thing about, uh... Say, Jim, that, that, uh, thing about picking Elizabeth's father out of the gutter is, uh... Is that true? Sure, it's true. Why? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, just wait till she pulls that Stuyvesant stuff on me again. <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> uh, thanks for a lovely evening, folks. Uh, come on, Lizzie. <laughs> yes, dear. 
<laughs> and, uh, Billy? Uh, yes, Father. Come on, Pipsqueak. <laughs> Well, we started with breakfast, and we might as well finish the same way. Let's drop in at the Hendersons at breakfast time the very next morning. The average children are still getting dressed. The average mother is racing around the kitchen. And the average father... Jim, where are you going? I got a rush, dear. Can't stop for breakfast. Just time to catch the bus. The bus? But I thought you said... Never mind what I said. Just tell Bud if he gets one scratch on that car, I'll brain him. (laughs) All right, dear. I'll be home at the usual time. Be a good girl. I'll try, dear. Oh, Jim? Yes? Uh, where did you leave the car keys? The keys? Oh, they're on the dresser. Uh, on top of Kathy's two bucks. Jim. Now what's the matter? Remind me to tell you, you're an angel. I'm a dope. You are not. I've got witnesses. Oh, well, why should I argue? After all, Father knows death. Members of our cast are Robert Young as Jim Henderson, June Whitley as Margaret Henderson, Rhoda Williams as Betty, Ted Donaldson as Bud, Norma Jean Nielsen as Catherine. Robert Young will soon be seen in RKO's Baltimore Escapade. Ted Donaldson may be seen in Warner Brothers' Decision of Christopher Blake. Others in tonight's cast were Virginia Gordon, Herb Weigand, and Sam Edwards. Music was written and conducted by Roy Bargain. Father Knows Best was conceived and written by Ed James. Entire production under the direction of Herb Sandler. Bill Foreman speaking. Mother, is Maxwell House really the only coffee in the world? Well, your father says so. And your father knows best. Yes, it's Father Knows Best, transcribed in Hollywood, starring Robert Young, his father. A half-hour visit with your new neighbors, the Andersons, brought to you by Maxwell House, the coffee that's bought and enjoyed by more people than any other brand of coffee at any price. Maxwell House, always good. To the last drop. It was Samuel Johnson who said, and with good reason, I'm sure, every man naturally persuades himself that he can keep his resolutions, nor is he convinced of his imbecility but by length of time and frequency of experiment. Well, in Springfield, in the white frame house on Maple Street, just such an experiment is about to begin, like this. Good morning, Margaret. Good morning, dear. Breakfast will be ready in just a moment. That's all right, dear. No hurry. Kids aren't down yet, are they? Well, no, but... Well, it is a holiday, Jim, and I just thought... Oh, it's all right with me, Margaret. After all, this is the last day of the year, and it's Saturday, and... Well, they deserve a little extra rest, don't they? Well, yes, dear. Anyway, it gives me a chance to tell you about something. I've, uh, I've had it on my mind for quite a while, and, well, it's about time I did something about it. Yes, dear? From now on, I'm not going to lose my temper. At any time. Now, what do you think of that? Well, I, I think it's wonderful, but... During 1950, I'm going to be the soul of patience. At home, at the office, everywhere. Patient old Jim, that's what they're going to call me. Jim. Yes, Margaret? You remember my grandmother, Williams. Not one of my real grandmothers. She was the one who took care of my mother when she was living in Middletown after the lumber company sent my father to Oregon and my sister Kathleen was born. No. (laughs) What? I don't remember her. Oh, well... She used to have a wonderful saying for people who wanted to control their tempers. Margaret, I don't need any special formula. I just won't lose my temper, that's all. I know, dear, but Grandmother Williams used to say, if you think your temper's going, just recite the Hottentot, 
And before you're halfway finished, why, it's back as like as not. Well, that's very pretty, but I'd rather do it my way. I just won't lose my temper. Well, Jim, if you were really sincere, you'd at least let me tell you what the hot and tot is. I don't care what the hot and tot is. I don't need the hot and tot. Why do you immediately leap to the conclusion that I need help in controlling my temper? I just won't lose it, that's all. You've already lost it. Now look, Margaret, I... Uh... All right, what's the hot and tot? Well, it's just an old saying we had when I was a girl. If to hoot and to toot, a hot and tot tot be taught by a hot and tot tutor, ought the tutor get hot if the hot and tot tot hoot and toot at the hot and tot tutor? That's all there is to it. <laughs> I'd rather lose my temper. Jim. Well, I'm not going to walk around babbling like a six-year-old idiot in search of a brain. To hoot and to toot. <laughs> Silliest darn thing I've ever heard. Doesn't even make sense. Yes, it does, dear. You see, it says that if a hot and tot tutor teaches a hot and tot tot to hoot and toot, well, the tutor has no one but himself to blame if the hot and tot tot hoots and toots at him. <laughs> Fine, I'll tell him when he comes in. <laughs> Jim, it's just supposed to divert your attention for a moment, that's all. Then you won't lose your temper. Margaret, I'm not going to. Uh, may I please have the morning paper? The paper? Oh, well, Betty came down to look at it first thing this morning. It's in the breakfast note. Thank you. Oh, no. Was there something wrong, dear? Margaret, look what she did to this paper. How in the world do they expect a man to read anything as messed up as this? Why is it that whenever I want to see anything around here... Jim? Somebody always... Somebody always... <clears throat> I will not lose my temper. I shall control my temper if it kills me. Good morning, Mother. Oh, good morning, Daddy. Morning, Father. I said good morning, Father. Father... Betty, I wouldn't bother your father this morning. But I didn't do anything. Oh... He found out I drove the car on a flat tire. You what? <laughs> Betty, please. Margaret. Yes, dear? <laughs> to hoot and toot what? <laughs> I'll write it down for you, dear. If to hoot and to toot... Hoot and toot. A hot and tot tot be taught by a hot and tot tutor... Ought the tutor get hot if the hot and tot tot hoot and toot at the hot and tot tutor? Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, Betty. <laughs> Good morning, Father. And how are you this beautiful morning? Well, I'm fine, thank you. Are you all right? <laughs> Just fine. Coffee about ready, Margaret? Well, yes, dear. Here you are. Thank you. Well, Betty, are you and Billy Smith planning on a big time tonight? Oh, yes, Father. Mr. Smith's going to let Billy have their brand new car, and we're going to a barn dance. In a barn! <laughs> well, what'll they think of next? <laughs> Say, Margaret. Yes, dear? Heck and Elizabeth are going to the party at the Hathaways, too, aren't they? Well, I think so. Well, if Heck's letting Billy take their new car, they won't have any transportation. We'd better arrange to pick them up. All right, dear. Will you call Elizabeth? Yes, dear. Fine. Daddy? Kathy, that wasn't you, was it? What wasn't me, Daddy? Morning, everybody. How's every little old thing? Oh, thank goodness. I thought for a minute we were going to have two elephants in the house. <laughs> What's the matter, Dad? Nothing, only I wish you'd learn to walk down the stairs. You bet. Hey, Mom, I'm starving. Poor little thing. Well, I haven't eaten since last night. <laughs> Say, Dad, speaking of money... Who said anything about money? <laughs> well, nobody, but I'm going to. I see. One stack of wheat's coming up. Thank you, ma'am. Kathy, may I have a syrup, please? Yes, Daddy. Thank you. You're welcome. Hmm. Christmas is over, too. <laughs> what were you saying, bud? Well, the way I figure it, a dollar a week is all right when you're 15, but... You see, I'll be 16 in another five or six months, and... Well, you see, when you're 15, you don't have to worry about girls much, but when you get to be 15 and a half, well... Let's say you go to the movies and you meet a girl. 
I mean, even if she buys her own ticket. You know what they charge for ice cream sodas? <laughs> Gosh. Even if you only get a root beer or something or... No, huh? <laughs> no. I didn't mean a lot, Dad. I just thought another 50 cents, quarter maybe. But don't you realize that if I gave you a larger allowance, you would never be sure if a girl liked you for your money or yourself. <laughs> Oh, gosh, who'd care? <laughs> but eat your breakfast and behave yourself. I don't have any breakfast to eat. I'll have your pancakes in just a minute, sir. Holy cow. Everybody else gets more than a dollar, and they don't even do half the things I do. Bud, I've had just about all the complaining I'm going to stand. If I hear one more word out of you, so help me... Jim? If the hoot and the toot are hot and tot... <laughs> all right. Bud, eat your breakfast. Holy cow, what was that? Never mind what it was. Eat your breakfast and be quiet. Holy cow. But I don't know what they teach you in your school, but for a 15-year-old boy, you have the most bovine vocabulary I've ever heard. <laughs> what does that mean? It means stop saying holy cow. Gee whiz. <laughs> Bud, nice hot pancakes. Oh, thanks, Mom. Bud. Yes, Dan? Did you put ashes on the driveway last night? Yes, Dan. And the front walk? Yes, Dan. Good. As soon as you've had your breakfast, please see if you can find my tire chains. It's going to be slippery driving tonight. Okay, Dan. Some more pancakes, dear? I'm afraid not, Margaret. I've got to get down to the office. Oh, that seems such a shame, Jim. Everybody else in town is taking a full weekend. Margaret, you certainly don't think I like the idea. But when Mr. Gribble says he wants to straighten out his insurance, well, we just straighten out his insurance, that's all. But couldn't it wait until Tuesday? Oh, no, that's next year. Mr. Gribble says it's got to be examined this year. Daddy? No. <laughs> Gee whiz, you'd think I was a stepchild or something. Well, I ought to be through by one anyway, so it won't be too bad. If I get through earlier, I'll come home for lunch. How's that? Oh, that'll be fine, dear. Oh, Jim, you forgot the Paper? Paper? Oh, the thing with the hot and tongue. Okay, let me have it. There you are, dear. Thank you. Be a good girl. I will. So long, kids. So Bye, long, Father. Bye, Daddy. I don't call you by noon. I'll have my lunch downtown. All right, dear. Drink your milk, Kathy. All I ever do is drink milk. <laughs> what happened to my other rubber? I don't know, dear. Did you look in the closet? Oh, never mind. I've got it. Goodbye. Goodbye, Bye. dear. Bye. Bye. Bud, I wish you'd learn not to annoy your father at breakfast. I didn't do anything. All I said was... Oh, dear. Now what? Oh, it sounded like he fell down. Oh. How could he fall down? I put ashes on the sidewalk. Oh, oh, oh Jim, oh, Jim, darling, what oh, happened? my back. Oh. My poor broken back. Oh. You fell down, huh, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I fell down. Why didn't you put ashes on the steps? You didn't say to put ashes on the steps. <laughs> you just said to put them on the sidewalk in the driveway. Margaret, where did I put that paper? I don't know, dear. Never I... mind, I've got it. Gosh, I, I'm sorry, Just Dad. a moment. If to hoot and to toot, a hot and tot tot, be taught by a hot and tot tooter, ought the tooter get hot if the hot and tot tot hoot and toot at the hot and tot tooter? Bud... Yes, Dan? Put ashes on the steps. <laughs> well, nobody can say father isn't trying. This time of year, good resolutions are mighty important to a man. Of course, good coffee, truly good coffee, like our Maxwell House, well, that's important the whole year round. How much it means, that wonderful good to the last drop flavor. No other coffee gives it to you. No coffee but Maxwell House. There's a reason for this, a good one. 
It's a recipe. The only recipe in the entire coffee world for that famous good-to-the-last-drop flavor. After all, what's the most important thing about coffee? Sure, it's flavor. And that flavor depends on the blend, the kind of coffees you choose for it, and how you put them together. Now, in different countries, on different plantations, coffee is grown in countless varieties, and you can combine them in many, many ways. But here's the point. There's only one way, one recipe, for our famous Maxwell House flavor. And this recipe of ours makes the great big difference between just any coffee and wonderfully good coffee that can add something friendly and cheering to every day of the year ahead. So think about it. If good coffee really means something to you, why don't you start enjoying America's favorite brand? Yes, tomorrow and every day. Enjoy Maxwell House coffee. It's always good to the last drop. In the white frame house on Maple Street, lunchtime has come and gone. As a matter of fact, so is dinner time, and Jim Anderson still hasn't returned. The rest of the family is eaten, but Father... Oh, just a minute. Here he comes now. Mr. Gribble? Of all the miserable, ill-mannered, inconsiderate, unreliable creatures that has ever been my misfortune to meet... Jim, is that you? I'll be in a minute, Margaret. You, Mr. Gribble, take the first, second, and third prizes. I wouldn't care if you owned a dozen factories. You want to place your insurance with another office, it's perfectly all right with me. Oh, Jim, dear, we've been awfully worried, and... Who are you talking to? Mr. Gribble, that puny excuse for a foghorn. Mr. Gribble, is he here? I don't know where he is. I've been waiting for him all day, and he still hasn't shown up. First it was 10 o'clock, then 1 o'clock, then 3, then 5. What's the matter, Dad? Anything wrong? No, everything's fine. Just dandy. We saved your dinner for you, dear. I had a sandwich downtown. The nerve of the guy, keeping me in the office a whole day, and then doesn't even have the decency... Jim. What is it, Margaret? To hoot and to toot. Oh, hoot and toot my foot. <laughs> Even a Hottentot has a right to get mad once in a while Well, I suppose you know best, dear Dad I wouldn't care if it were just an ordinary business day I, I could understand that Dad But he knew I was going to the office just to meet him He knew it was a holiday weekend Say, Dad There wasn't another office open in the entire building Nobody to talk to, nothing Dad What? <laughs> what? What is it? What do you want? Oh, uh, I... Oh, I found the tire chains Good they're busted. <laughs> oh, I don't know. This was such a nice year. Why did it have to end like this? What's wrong with the chains, bud? They're a mess. Kathy really fixed them. I did not. I didn't even touch them. All right, Kathy, never mind. Margaret. Yes, dear? Do you suppose Kathy could have dictaphones planted around the house? <laughs> I wouldn't think so, dear. Then how could she hear us clear out in the kitchen? Bud, I haven't even seen the tire chain since Thanksgiving. Well, that's when you busted them. Oh, I did not. You certainly did. I certainly didn't. You certainly did. I certainly didn't. All right, kids, please. I can't take any of that tonight. I've got a splitting headache, and I'd like things to be peaceful and quiet just for a little while. Okay, then. I didn't bust them. <laughs> All right, Kathy. Time for your bath, and then get ready for bed. You mean now? I mean now. Drink your milk. Take a bath. Go to bed. Boy, am I in a rut. <laughs> Jim, maybe if you took a little nap... You'd... Oh, it isn't that bad, honey. I'll be all right if we can manage just a little less confusion around here. Father, may I talk to you for a minute, please? Sure, why doesn't everybody talk to me? Let's invite the General Council of the United Nations in for the weekend. <laughs> Betty, your father has a headache. Well, creepers, all I said was could I talk to him for a minute? What's wrong with that? Not a thing, Betty. What is it? Well, Billy Smith said, his father said, that he could have the car. But if it's going to be slippery out, and the radio said it was going to be the worst New Year's Eve we've had in Springfield in over 20 years, and they wouldn't be surprised if we even had more snow before morning. He can. <laughs> if a hot and tot toots a toot and toot toot. Betty, 
This is not the time to annoy your father with Billy Smith's problems. But, Mother, if it's going to snow... I'll get it. Betty, let me put it this way. If a blizzard and six other forms of common disaster were to strike Springfield at this particular moment, I still wouldn't care what Billy Smith's father said to Billy Smith. Hello? Oh, hello. Sure, just a minute. Dad? Yes? It's Mr. Smith. Well, naturally, the way I feel, who else could it possibly be? (laughs) Hello, Heck. Hey, Jim, uh, you're going to that uh, shindig at the Hathaways, aren't you? That's right, Heck. Uh, Well, I was just wondering, how'd you like to drive over with us? Uh, You got a new car, you know. Yes, I know, Heck, but Betty said you were going to let Billy have your car. Yeah, well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about, Jim. You see, the way I figure it, after all, Billy is going with Betty, and I've got a brand new car, and if they get a few scratches on that old heap of yours, it wouldn't make an awful lot of difference. (laughs) Did you say something, Jim? No, not yet. (laughs) Oh, well, uh, like I was saying, now, if you were to let Billy use your old car... Hoot. (laughs) Then we could go in my new car... Toot. (laughs) How about it, Jim? The hot and tot toots are toot and (laughs) tot. Hack day? Yes? No. <laughs> Never in all my life have I ever heard anything like that. Well, what is it, dear? He wants me to lend Billy my car so his car won't get scratched up. The nerve of the man. Father, you mean you said no? I most emphatically said no. Margaret, what's gotten into everybody? I don't know, dear. If that isn't the worst example of... of I think the whole world is going nuts. And I'm going with them. But... <laughs> Never mind, bud, I'll answer it. Doesn't want his car scratched up. But if they skid mine into a telephone pole, that'd be all right. Jim, my boy, I'm terribly sorry. I wouldn't have had this happen for the world. Oh, uh, well, come on in, Mr. Grimmel. Thank you. I got all tied up with my lawyers, and, well, I can only hope you'll forgive me. Oh, sure. I, that's the sort of thing that can happen to anybody. Uh, let me have your coat. Oh, thank you. I'll just drop it here in the chair. Jim, if you're going to change your coat, you better... Oh, hello, Mr. Gribble. Uh, Mrs. Anderson. Well, all dressed up, I see. Now, Margaret, Mr. Gribble and I are going into the den, but we won't be long. All right, dear. Come along, Mr. Gribble. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's no hurry. I'm going to help Betty dress. Charming woman, Mrs. Anderson. Absolutely charming. Uh, you're a lucky man, Jim. Yes, indeed, a very lucky man. Thank you. Uh, sit down, Mr. Gribble. Well, Jim, shall we get started? Get what? we got a busy night ahead of us, so let's go to work. Now, oh, wait a minute. You mean you came out here to go through your insurance tonight? Well, naturally, this is the 31st. Tomorrow starts the new year. Got to have my affairs in order by midnight. Why? Why? Good Lord, man. What do you mean, why? Because. Well, because I've always done it that way. That's why. Now, let's have an end to this foolishness and get to work. Or would you rather I place my insurance with another organization? What's that? Mr. Gribble, I made a resolution for the new year, so I want you to notice that I am in complete control of my temper. My hand is steady, my eye is clear, and yet, very calmly and with absolute composure, I say, Mr. Gribble, you are an idiot. He's gone mad. (laughs) You know, I think you're right. But this is New Year's Eve. I'm going to a party with my wife. We're going to have a good time. You and your lawyers and your insurance and your big fat factories can go jump into the nearest lake. He has gone, man. <laughs> I'm not Jim Anderson. I'm a hot and tot tot, and I don't give a hoot. <laughs> so goodbye, Mr. Gribble. Here's your coat. Here's your hat. Goodbye. Good luck, and I'll see you around the pool room. Well, business is picking up. Hiya, Jim. Oh, you. Oh, come on in, Hack. Well, thanks. Don't mind if I do. (laughs) Oh, hello, Mr. Gribble. (laughs) Uh, Goodbye, Mr. Gribble. What's the matter with him? Too much money. (laughs) What's your excuse? (laughs) Jim, I, uh, I came over to apologize. Oh, you did, huh? You know... 
I waited a long time for that car, Jim, but, well, heck, I'd rather have an old friend than a new car any day. How about it, Jim? <laughs> sure. Never even happened. Ah, uh, thanks, pal. Oh, could we uh, pick Elizabeth up on the way to the party? Where's your car? Oh, Billy's got it outside. And so help me if he gets one scratch on it. <laughs> you don't suppose he will, do you, Jim? <laughs> Why, of course not. Yeah, busy little place you got here, isn't it? Just like living in an alley. <laughs> Anderson, I want to talk to you. All right, let's go back into the den. Will you excuse us, Heck? Oh, sure. Don't worry about me. I'll take Bud outside and show him the new car. All right, Mr. Gribble, what's on your mind? Anderson? Yes? Jim? Yes? Do you really think I'm an idiot? <laughs> well, when you put it that way, yes. <laughs> you know what? What? You're right. <laughs> But you're the first man in 20 years who had the courage to tell me. <coughs> Jim, I'm... I'm not really an idiot. I'm just lonesome. You? Uh-huh. Well, where's your family? Oh, uh, they go south for the winter. Been doing it for 20 years. And, Jim, I don't mind being alone in that big house, but... Not on New Year's Eve. You mean you've been pulling a gag like this for 20 years? Well, not exactly like this. I've never been caught before. <laughs> <laughs> well, why didn't you say so? You could have spent the evening with us. You still can. Oh, you're going to a party. That's nothing. So are you. Well, what do you know? <laughs> and I won't even have to talk about insurance. <laughs> Ye gods, now what? But, 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 what's going on out there? It's okay, Dad. Mr. Smith pushed the horn and it got stuck. <laughs> oh, fine. Jim, is anything wrong? No, dear. Everything's all right. All right. Everything's wonderful. <laughs> Happy New Year! <laughs> This time of year, enthusiasm like Mr. Gribble's is catching. And that's something we're all in favor of. We hope everything's wonderful with you, too. Yes, and during the year ahead, we hope it'll be even more so. For our part, during 1950, we're going to see to it that you enjoy wonderfully good coffee every pound of Maxwell House you open. I know that these days, more than ever before, you're on the lookout for the most in flavor for every penny you spend. And next year, just as every year for more than half a century, that's what you can expect in every pound of our Maxwell House coffee. A generous extra measure of flavor, of freshness and fragrance in every familiar blue tin. And with this promise from Maxwell House, let me extend again our sincerest wishes to you for a very happy and healthy new year. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the star of our show, Mr. Robert Young. Thank you very much. Tonight, for the first time since this program went on the air, I'm stepping out of character to make a personal appeal to our radio audience. During the next year, which is only a few days away, we on Father Knows Best are to be actively associated with the Inter-Industry Highway Safety Committee, an organization formed at the personal request of President Truman. The purpose of this committee is to combat the greatest menace our nation has ever known, a menace which each year takes a greater toll of life than even so fearsome a killer as war. I refer, of course, to the careless or perhaps just thoughtless Drivers who race with breakneck and foolhardy speed along our open highways and through our city streets. We'll tell you more about it next year, but now we'd like to jump the gun just a little bit. There's a long weekend coming up, and it's been predicted that hundreds of men, women, and children will lose their lives during that three-day period. Think of it. 
the National Safety Council anticipates that horrible and unnecessary loss of life. And in the past, they've been unfortunately correct. Now, why don't you do your part this weekend to make them wrong? Have a good time. Have a lot of fun. But don't take any chances. Drive carefully. Drive thoughtfully. And enjoy the happiest of new years. If you like good things the easy way Good things the easy way Instant Maxwell House, that's for you Good, good coffee that's easy too No time, no trouble No frowns, no fuss And it's good to the very last You know what? Yes, Instant Maxwell House means great coffee instantly in your cup Here's real instant coffee All pure Maxwell House coffee in instant form Enjoy Instant Maxwell House Instantly Good to the very last you no, what? Father Knows Best was transcribed in Hollywood and written by Ed James. Join us again next week when we'll be back with Father Knows Best, starring Robert Young as Jim Anderson, with Roy Bargey and the Maxwell House Orchestra, and yours truly, Bill Foreman. So until next Thursday night, for myself and for the makers of Maxwell House Coffee and Instant Maxwell House, let me wish you again a very happy and healthy new year. Now stay tuned in for Screen Guild Theater, which follows immediately over most of these stations. James Stewart leads the cast on Screen Guild Theater, next on NBC. By transcription. Mother, is Maxwell House the best coffee in the whole world? Well, your father says so, and your father knows best. <laughs> Yes, it's Father Knows Best, starring Robert Young as father. A half-hour visit with your new neighbors, the Andersons. Brought to you by Maxwell House. The coffee that's bought and enjoyed by more people than any other brand of coffee at any price. Maxwell House, always good to the last drop. <laughs> Another year is underway. All the excitement of Christmas and New Year's is over. But in the average home, the usual problems of life and living still remain. In Springfield, in the white frame house on Maple Street, the Andersons, like any average family, are back in a well-ordered group. But being an average family, you can bet they won't stay there very long. They never do, do they? Mother? Yes, Kathy? When I finish my dinner, may I go over to Patty Davis's? All right, dear, if you don't stay too long. Mother, how can she? This is her week to dry. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry, Kathy, I forgot. Snitcher. <laughs> Kathy, please be quiet and eat your dinner. All right, Daddy. Mom? Yes, bud? I'll be glad to dry the dishes to Kathy. You will? Well, that's very nice, dear. But it's Kathy's chore, and she'd better do it herself. Gee whiz. <laughs> Margaret. Uh, yes, dear? You know, it's very funny, but I could have sworn I heard Bud say he'd dry the dishes for Kathy. I did. You said you'd dry the dishes for Kathy? Sure. You mean just like that? Sure, why not? You know, I think I've been working too hard. <laughs> Everything sounds so strange <laughs> It was the holidays, dear They're quite a strain Well, it's something You uh, feel all right, don't you, bud? I feel fine Maybe I'll go to bed right after dinner That ought to fix me up <laughs> But, dear, I told you Judge Mitchell said he was going to call He's been trying to get you all day I know Probably wants me to serve on that highway safety committee You know, Margaret, you'd think I was the only man in Springfield That could make a speech 
Every time somebody dreams up a committee or a drive or a bond rally, get Jim Anderson. Get Jim Anderson. Speeches here, speeches there. Jim, you love it and you know it. But I don't have the time. I don't think I've ever been so busy in my entire life. Anything we can do, Father? No, Betty, I'm afraid not. You know what I've got to do now, Margaret? I've got to revise the schedule on every automobile policy in the office. The rates went up again today. No, Jim, really? How come, Dad? Reckless drivers, that's how come. Oh. 7,100 kids between the ages of 15 and 24 killed in one year. And it's getting worse all the time. Bud. Yes, Dad? Did you take the ashes out this afternoon? Yes, sir, I sure did. Uh, you don't have a report card you want me to sign, do you? Oh, no, Dad. We won't have those until the end of the month. I see. Uh, how's your allowance holding up? Fine, Dad, just great. I don't get it. May I have my coffee, please? Of course, dear. There you are. You don't get what, Dad? This sudden burst of sweetness and light. What are you up to? Why, nothing, Dad, nothing at all. He's probably in love. Oh, mush. Girls. All they can think about is love. I'll get it. No, Betty, wait. Uh, Margaret, would you answer it, please? Well, of course, dear, if that's what you want. And if it's Judge Mitchell, tell him I'm out. I um, had a business engagement and won't be back until late. All right, I just hope you know what you're doing. Hello? Oh, hello, Judge Mitchell. Uh, no, I'm awfully sorry, but Jim had to go out. Yes, a, a business call. Daddy. Kathy, be quiet, please. Uh, that'll be fine, Judge Mitchell. I'll be sure to tell him as soon as he comes in. Good night. Daddy. What is it, Kathy? You told a fib. <laughs> I did no such thing. Jim, Judge Mitchell said he'd try you again later. Fine. Give him a horse and he'd make a Canadian Mountie look sick. You said you were out and you weren't out. And if that isn't a fib, what is? I, uh, I think I'll have another piece of cake, Margaret. <laughs> All right, dear. Daddy? Yes, Kathy? You said you were out and you weren't out. And if that isn't a fib, what is? Kathy, I heard you the first time. Well? <laughs> <laughs> Margaret. Oh, no, don't get me involved in this. I have enough troubles of my own. Love, honor, and obey. For better or for worse. <laughs> Fine stuff. Um, uh, Kathy. Yes, Daddy? As you grow older, you learn to distinguish between telling an untruth and uh, telling something that isn't true. <laughs> I mean, if you tell an untruth because you're afraid to tell the truth, it's worse than if you don't tell the truth merely because you feel that if you do tell the truth, you see, Kathy, there are times when if you tell an untruth, it isn't really an untruth, because you mean to tell the truth, but, well, you, you want to be kind, that's all. <laughs> Betty, please. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Betty. Go ahead, Dad, I think it's very interesting. <laughs> What is? What you just said. You mean you understood it? Of course. Well, I'm glad somebody did. <laughs> How about you, Kathy? I guess so. It's a fib when you're little, but when you grow up, it isn't. <laughs> no, Kathy, that isn't it at all. It's, well, all right, I told a fib. I shouldn't have, but I did. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, can't you see Dad's tired? Why don't you leave him alone? Bud, stick out your tongue. What for? <laughs> Never mind what for. Just stick your tongue out. Uh... <clears throat> Look all right to you, Margaret? Just beautiful, dear. One of the loveliest tongues I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Bud. Put it back in. <laughs> Holy cow, now I can't even have any privacy with my own tongue Finish your milk, dear Well, how old do you have to be before people stop looking at your tongue anyway? When you get that old, you start looking at it yourself <laughs> All right, bud, please see who's at the door Okay 
Why don't you look at Betty's tongue once in a while? She's goofier than anybody. Why, Bud Anderson, you little snip. Betty, that'll be enough of that. But, Father... I said that'll be enough of that. Now, either finish your dinner or go to your room. Oh, I'll be glad to. After you finish the dishes. Oh. May I have the sugar, please? Yeah, there you are, dear. Tell me I'm goofy. <laughs> Say, Dad, it's the minister. Dr. Swain? Well, have him come in. Oh, he said he'll wait for you in the living room. Oh, dear, is, is my hair all right? Do you think I ought to change my dress? You and Dr. Swain going out dancing? <laughs> Jim, stop being ridiculous. Uh, Bud, will you help the girls with the dishes tonight, please? Sure, Mom, I'll be glad to. Thank you, dear. Well, shall we go in, Jim? Hmm? Oh, sure. Say, Margaret. Yes, dear? What do you suppose is wrong with Bud? Jim, you have a very suspicious nature. No, I just have a very normal son. Well, how are you, Dr. Swain? Mr. Anderson and Mrs. Anderson. Oh, it's so nice seeing you, Dr. Swain. Well, I hope you'll think so after you learn why I'm here. Oh? Uh, sit down, doctor, please. Mrs. Anderson? Well, thank you. Ah, there we are. <laughs> that is better, isn't it? Uh, Dr. Swain, this visit wouldn't have anything to do with Bud, would it? Your son? Oh, dear, no. Is anything wrong? No, I was just wondering, that's all. I see. No, no, my visit is based, shall we say, uh, on a far more general community requirement, a need which applies to our entire congregation rather than any individual. Uh, Dr. Swain, you know, we've just gone through a pretty severe case of Christmas, and... Uh, Jim, please. Well, I just want Dr. Swain to know. Mr. Anderson, I'm not looking for donations. Well, <laughs> at this time. Oh. No, no, what I'm looking for right now is advice. Oh, well. Uh, you see, at a meeting the other night, the question of family relations was brought up for discussion. Obligations of parents and children to one another. Uh, that sort of thing, you know. I see. Unfortunately, the majority of those present had rather vague ideas concerning the matter under discussion. And since Mrs. Swain and I have never been blessed with a family, I could add but little light on the subject, of a practical nature, that is. <clears throat> uh, that is why I've come to you. Well, of course, Dr. Swain. Uh, anything we can do to help? Ah, I knew I could count on the Anderson. As I told the others, the Anderson children are so thoroughly normal and so nicely behaved uh, for the most part. I am sure anything their parents tell us will be of the utmost interest and assistance. Oh, you mean you want a speech? Well, well, not a speech, really. Just an informative little talk at our meeting tomorrow night. Oh, well, look, Dr. Swain, you know I'd like to help, but I'm actually up to my ears at work. Well, I'm sure you must be, Mr. Anderson, but you see that... It's not that I don't want to cooperate, Dr. Swain. You know I always have in the past. Of course you have, but you see but that... But after is... all, this is just a simple problem. I'm sure that any other father in the congregation will be only too glad to help you. But, Mr. Anderson, we don't want a father. After all, family relations are merely a practical application of... You what? <laughs> we don't want a father. We feel that the crystal clear viewpoint of a mother is what this particular problem requires. A mother? You mean... Precisely. We want Mrs. Anderson. Oh. We'll go along with Dr. Swain on that. Why, any number of problems call for mother's crystal clear viewpoint. Take coffee as another example. Who knows better than mother the wonderful difference a really good cup of coffee can make? Coffee like our Maxwell House. Mmm, that wonderful good to the last drop flavor. You won't find it, you know, in any other coffee. No coffee but Maxwell House. And there's a particular reason why. It's a recipe, the only recipe under the sun for good to the last drop flavor. It's mighty important, that recipe. And here's why. After all, the most important thing about coffee is flavor. And that flavor depends on the blend, the kind of coffees in it, and how they're put together. Now, throughout the world, coffee grows in countless different varieties, and you can combine them in all sorts of ways. 
But there's only one way, one recipe for our famous Maxwell House flavor. And this recipe of ours accounts for the difference, the big difference between the flavor of just any coffee and the wonderfully good flavor of America's favorite brand. But I want you to know how truly good our Maxwell House is on your own. So tomorrow, open up a pound and enjoy Maxwell House, the coffee that's always good to the last drop. It's less than an hour later in the white frame house on Maple Street. Dr. Swain is gone. The Anderson kids are deep in their homework. Father is deep in his newspaper. Mother is up to her neck in preparation for a speech. And when it comes to speeches, Margaret is a wonderful cook. Pretty, too. Jim. Yes, Margaret? What would you say was the most important link between a father and a son? Money. <laughs> Jim, I'm very serious. So am I. May I please read my paper? If I could only find a central theme. Not juvenile delinquency. Everybody's done that. Jim? Yes, Margaret? Did the automobile insurance rates really go up today? That's right. Did the home office say why? Of course they did. The number of accidents involving youngsters under the age of... Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> You write your own speech. You're mean. There isn't one other husband in Springfield who wouldn't be glad to help his wife. Margaret, you're absolutely right. I'm nothing but a beast. You mean you're going to help me? No, but I acknowledge the fact that I'm a beast. <laughs> now, may I read my paper? Jim, if you wanted to make the speech, why didn't you say so? If I wanted... Margaret, where did you ever get a ridiculous idea like that? Well, you're sulking like a spoiled child. I'm trying to read my newspaper. It amounts to the same thing. Margaret, I told Dr. Swain I didn't want to make the speech. You heard me tell him. Rubbish. You just wanted him to coax you. Oh, for Pete's sake. Margaret, why is... It certainly isn't my fault that he wanted a mother's viewpoint. Jim, where are you going? I'm going to indulge in one of my pleasant little whimsies. When the doorbell rings, I'd like to see if maybe somebody rang it. Hello, Jim. Oh, uh, hello, Judge Mitchell. Uh, come in. Thank you. Well, it's certainly nice seeing you. I'm sorry I wasn't in when you called. Uh, let me take your thing. All right. Hello, Mrs. Anderson. How are you this evening? Why, Judge Mitchell, what a pleasant surprise. Won't you come in and sit down? <laughs> yes, thank you. Jim, uh, what I have to say won't take very long. There's no need to rush, Judge. You know, I was just saying to Margaret just a little while ago, the fathers of this community ought to take a more active interest in public affairs. Wasn't I, Margaret? Weren't you what, dear? Wasn't I saying what I just said? <laughs> oh, of course, yes. Naturally, being in the insurance business, I have to make a great many calls during the uh, evening, but in spite Jim, of that... Jim, uh, I'm sure you're leading up to something very interesting, but I'm a busy man and I haven't got much time. Is Bud at home? Why, uh, yes, he's in his room. Would you call him, please? Of course. Uh, Bud! You want me, Dad? Yes, would you please come down here? Okay. <laughs> Bud and the stairs don't get along very well. <laughs> if there's anything that you want me to do, Dad, I... Uh-oh. Good evening, Bud. Bud, Judge Mitchell is speaking to you. I know. I mean, hello. Uh, good evening, sir. Bud, have you told your parents? No, sir, I haven't. Oh, there was something. I had a feeling. Well, go ahead, Bud. Let's get on with it. Dad, uh, Mom, I was out for a ride with the fellas this afternoon, and we, uh, we knocked over Judge Mitchell's tree. His tree? Oh, Bud. What were you driving, a tank? <laughs> well, it, it was just a little tree, Dad, and all the fellas are going to chip in and buy a new one. Gosh, we said we were sorry. I should think you would be. Judge Mitchell, Bud and his friends will replace your tree. I give you my word. Jim, it's not the tree that bothers me. You mean there's more? Well, my principal concern is the manner in which the tree was destroyed. Tell him, bud. Well, we were playing chicken. 
Bud, after all I've said to you... Jim, I'm afraid I don't understand. What is chicken? Oh, it's a game these kids thought up. We didn't think it up, Dan. Well, whoever did ought to have his head examined. If he still has a head. Driving a car at full speed with nobody holding the wheel. The first one who gets a little sense into his thick skull and tries to control the car, he's chicken and he loses. Oh, Bud, how could you? Gosh, Mom, everybody does it. And if all the fellas hadn't gotten chicken at the same time, we'd have been all right. But, well, everybody grabbed for the wheel at once and... Heck, it was only a tree. It was only a tree. Bud, you can kneel down and thank all of your guardian angels that it was only a tree. What if your mother had been standing where that tree was? Or Betty, or Kathy. Would you have been able to stop any sooner or steer any better? No, I I guess not. You guess not? Well, we'll go into this matter in great detail, believe me. Judge Mitchell. Yes, Jim? Bud was wrong, but I want you to know that I feel he isn't solely to blame. Oh, I suppose not, but... uh... It's, uh, I don't mean the other boys. I have reference to myself. Oh, I'm going to be very honest, Judge Mitchell, very frank. I owe you a very humble apology. You mean for not being home so consistently? I uh, avoided you all day because I thought you wanted me to serve on your highway Highway safety safety committee. I thought I was too busy. I'd let someone else take care of it. After all, my son was a competent driver. Why worry about the other fellow's problem? Judge Mitchell, my son is not a competent driver, and the fault is mine. I taught him the mechanics of driving, how to start and stop a car and how to steer, but I failed to teach him the responsibility that goes with a car. I put a ton of steel in his hands, a weapon as deadly as any gun, and I failed to impress upon his mind the fact that when he's in a car, he holds the power of life and death in his fingertips. But he's going to be taught, Judge Mitchell. Before he touches a steering wheel again, he's going to know the full meaning of his responsibility. The car is not a toy. It's not an instrument for childish games. And he'll drive sensibly, safely, courteously, or I give you my word, he'll never drive again. Now, um, about the tree... Well, uh, we can just forget the tree, Jim. Let's say that it died for worthy cause. Jim. Yes, Margaret? Do you know what you just did? You just gave my speech. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to muscle in on your territory. (laughs) Oh, Jim, will you please stop being silly? Why don't you go along with me tomorrow and tell the same things to the other parents? I think they learn a great deal. Margaret, you know I don't want to make any speeches. Well, whatever you say, dear. But as long as you insist, I, uh... (laughs) Well, I guess I might as well. (laughs) All right, dear. Father knows best. So Father's going to make his speech after all. Well, that's fine, because he does have something important to say. And right now, so do I. These days, when you buy coffee... You want the most in flavor for every penny you spend. After all, flavor's what you're paying for. And we don't think you can beat the famous flavor we pack into every pound of Maxwell House. But here's the point. Air can steal coffee flavor. And ordinary containers, like paper bags, can't prevent roasted coffee from losing flavor, whether it's ground or whole bean. That's why we take our Maxwell House, still fresh and fragrant from our roasting ovens, and carefully vacuum pack it in the familiar blue tin. That way, no air gets in, and none of that wonderful flavor gets out. So the next pound of coffee you buy, be sure you get all the flavor and fragrance you pay for. You will with Maxwell House coffee. Always good to the last drop. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, Father Knows Best is honored by a celebrated and rather unusual guest. An article concerning him and his wonderful work appeared in the November issue of Liberty Magazine and was reprinted in the December issue of Reader's Digest. That takes care of the celebrated part of it. As for the unusual, well, so far as I know, he is the only traffic court judge in the history of the United States 
ever to have warranted the use of the term popular. It's an honor and a very great privilege to introduce a young man who has made the city of Los Angeles a safer place in which to live, Judge Roger Fogg. Thank you. Good evening, Bob. Uh, Your Honor, I, uh, <laughs> doggone, I just can't get used to feeling comfortable with a traffic court judge. I feel like I've just gone through a red light or something. Well, that'll be $25. <laughs> I said I feel like I've gone through it. Well, in that case, we'll suspend sentence, but don't let it happen again. Oh, thank you, Judge Fogg. I uh, believe you know what we on Father Knows Best are trying to accomplish. I do, Bob. And I can't recommend too highly or endorse more heartily the program you are spearheading. The question of accidents involving young drivers and the unfortunate incidents of traffic casualties and fatalities has become a serious problem in every community in the nation. Something has to be done about it, and fast. You see, Bob, if it were a single problem, we could cope with it quite easily. If all the teenage drivers were incompetent or careless, we could insist that they avail themselves of the driver education and training courses being given in many high schools throughout America. A great many boys and girls have taken these courses and are taking them right now. But our problem is with competent drivers, skilled drivers, the youngster who is so confident of his ability that he takes ridiculous chances with his life and yours. Less than a year ago, a lad was brought into my courtroom on a charge so fantastic that it is almost unbelievable. This boy was driving a car in excess of 55 miles an hour without a steering wheel. Well, there's there... only one uh, suitable comment for that. Bud's favorite and all-inclusive, holy cow. This boy was steering with a pair of pliers, and he was so confident of his ability that he couldn't for the life of him understand why we considered him a potential murderer. You see, Bob, that's the way these boys and girls must think of themselves whenever they take those wild, split-second chances, whenever they play chicken or hubcap tag or any of their other reckless and ridiculous games. In spite of their skill, which we do not question, in spite of their youth, which gives them reflexes much faster than yours or mine, these drivers are death on wheels. Their accidents going somewhere to happen. Well, Judge Faf, you don't mean that, of course, to apply to all young drivers. Oh, no, Bob, of course not. Most of them, I know, are sensible, intelligent youngsters. But it's hard to tell the innocent from the guilty, and so they all get a bad name. That's why I think the highway safety plan, as you explained it to me, should be welcomed by the young drivers. Why don't you tell them about it? Okay, I'll do it right now. Through the Inter-Industry Highway Safety Committee, which was formed at the request of President Truman, two clubs have been set up a man-to-man -man club for fathers and sons, and a counterpart on the distaff side for dads and daughters. Voluntary good driver agreements are provided for. These are agreements between parents and children to be signed by both, and they involve pledges on both sides. The father promises to grant permission to his son or daughter to drive the family car at appropriate times. And the youngster, well, he or she has to promise to abide by eight good driving rules. But they're sensible rules designed not to take the joy out of life, but rather to give you a longer life to enjoy. With each man-to-man -man or dad-to-daughter agreement, there is a membership card, and I'd like to see them riding in teenage pockets and hat bands all over the country. You know, Bob, that's quite an idea. Those membership cards will help to separate the black sheep from the innocence of the flock. The youngsters who are careful drivers, intelligent drivers, will no longer have to protest that it's the other fellow who takes chances, the other fellow who plays the wild games, the other fellow who gives all drivers a bad name. They can prove, by living up to the terms of these membership cards, that they have a right to the respect of their elders and a right to share the highways with their fellow citizens. Parents and young drivers, why don't you get one of these agreements right away? They're yours for the asking. Just send a note to the Robert Young Good Drivers Club, care of your local NBC station, and we'll shoot the works right back at you. Well, I guess that just about does it. Can you think of anything else, Judge Foff? Yes, just one other thing. 
You know I have a slightly selfish interest in your whole highway safety movement. How is that? Well, I figure that if you can get all the drivers of this country to operate their vehicles safely, carefully, and with simple, good old-fashioned American courtesy, well, every once in a while, fellows like me will have a chance to go fishing. Good night, Bob. Good night, Judge Bob, and thank you for coming. If you like good things the easy way, good things the easy way, instant Maxwell House, that's for you. Good, good coffee that's easy too. No time, no trouble, no grounds, no fun. And it's good to the very last. You, you know, know what? Yes, instant Maxwell House means great coffee instantly in your cup. Here's real instant coffee. All pure Maxwell House coffee in instant form. Enjoy instant Maxwell House. Instantly. Good to the very last. You know what? Join us again next week when we'll be back with Father Knows Best, starring Robert Young as Jim Anderson, with Roy Bargey and the Maxwell House Orchestra, and yours truly, Bill Foreman. Don't forget, parents and youngsters, for your voluntary pledges and membership cards, just write to the Robert Young Good Drivers Club, care of your local NBC station. Now it's time to say goodnight, so until next Thursday, good luck from the makers of Maxwell House, America's favorite brand of coffee. Always good to the last drop. Father Knows Best was transcribed in Hollywood and written by Ed James. Now stay tuned in for Screen Guild Theater, which follows immediately over most of these stations. Hear Dan Daly and Ann Baxter on Screen Guild Theater next on NBC. Mother, is Maxwell House really the only coffee in the world? Well, your father says so, and your father knows best. Yes, it's Father Knows Best, transcribed in Hollywood, starring Robert Young as father. A half-hour visit with your new neighbors, the Andersons, brought to you by Maxwell House the coffee that's bought and enjoyed by more people than any other brand of coffee at any price. Maxwell House, always good to the last drop. In every family, there are special days. Days which, though simple, will live forever in our memories. There's the day Junior had his first haircut. The day Dad backed into the garage door. Or the day Mother didn't back into the garage door. In Springfield, in the white frame house on Maple Street, it's dinner time. And one of those days is in the making. It will be known, as long as an Anderson remains, as the day Father received the Christmas bills. Like this. It's outrageous, that's what it is The most outrageous thing I've ever seen in my entire life Pass the potatoes to your father, Betty Yes, Mother Potatoes, Father uh, Thank you It's gotten so that Christmas isn't a period of joy and celebration It's a plot to collect all the money overlooked by the government <laughs> I've never seen such an assortment of bills Kathy, won't you please eat your dinner? But I have to watch Daddy I'm sure he'd much rather you ate your dinner but I want to see the steam come out of his ears. The what? <laughs> well, Bud said when you saw all those bills... Holy cow, Kathy. I didn't mean it really would. I was just, you know... <laughs> <laughs> sure was cold out today, wasn't it? <laughs> well, for certain people, it's going to get warmer. Much warmer. Now the bread, please. Here you are, Dan. Thank you. Say, Dan... Look at this, $17.70 for mucklucks. Now, what the devil are mucklucks? The knitted slippers, dear. For $17.70? That's for six pair, Jim. I sent them to my sister Kathleen and her family. Oh, fine. And what did she send us? 
Five napkin rings painted by hand in the kindergarten of a school for backward children. <laughs> Jim, that's not the proper attitude to take. Oh, it isn't, isn't it? You don't see that brother-in-law of yours shelling out any 1770 for mucklucks, do you? I tell you, Margaret, we've got to realize that we aren't the Morgans or the Rockefellers. We're just plain, simple people, and we've got to act that way. Yes, dear. Say, Dad. When I was a boy, thrift was an important part of the daily life. The family worked together to see how little it could spend, not how much. They tried to help put something away for a rainy day. Not us. This family lives in a continual cloudburst. Dad. What is it, bud? As long as we're talking about money, I need five dollars. Bud. <laughs> Oh, that's fine. That's just great. I give out with a long lecture on thrift and economy, and all it does is remind my son that he needs $5. Now, why do you need $5? To be a bird watcher. <laughs> a what? A bird watcher. You watch birds. I wouldn't care if you watched elephants. <laughs> why does it have to cost $5? Well... You have to buy a manual. It tells you how to watch. And you get a button. And they have meetings every Tuesday and Thursday night. No. But, Dad, watching birds makes you alert. No. It gives you a better understanding of your feathered friends. No. And it's educational. No. Oh, gosh. You certainly want me to be educated, don't you? Yes. Then I can go? No. <laughs> oh. oh. Would you care for some more coffee, dear? I certainly would. Thank you. I'll bet Evelyn Finney's a bird watcher. You keep out of this, Kathy. Bud's got a girl. I have not. You just wait, Kathy, that's all. Just wait. Bud's got a girl. Dad. All right, Kathy, stop that and drink your milk. But I did. It's all gone. Well, get some more milk and drink it. <laughs> Gee whiz. And behave yourself. Now, where was I? The part about putting something away for a rainy day. Thank you. Rainy day. Oh, look, I don't want you to think I'm being stingy or that I don't want you to enjoy a healthy, normal life, but what's that? What's what, dear? On the buffet. Is that another album of records? Oh, you ought to hear them, Father. They're simply dreamy. You see, that's what I mean. A new album, and we've got so many records now we can join the disc jockey's union. <laughs> Do disc jockeys have a union, Daddy? How do I know? Well, you just said I that... said if they had a union, we could join it. Why? <laughs> because we have so many records. Are you going to be a disc jockey, Daddy? No, I'm not going to be a disc jockey. <laughs> Why not? Because I'm an insurance jockey. I mean... <laughs> Oh, Kathy, drink your milk. I did. Twice. <laughs> well, eat your cake. I don't have any cake. What have you got? Jello. Well, eat it and be quiet. <laughs> Gee whiz. Father, there's no need to get excited about the record. Now, don't tell me what to get excited about and what not to get excited about. You have no right to waste money on more records. But, Father... Five dollars for bird watchers and five dollars for records. They cost seven fifty. Seven fifty. <laughs> Betty Anderson, you mean those records cost seven dollars and fifty cents? Yes, Father, Oh, but... that's fine. Just fine. We've got records you haven't touched in five years, but they're no good. You've got to buy new ones for $7.50. But, Father... When I was a boy, I couldn't buy a new record till the old one wore out. But, Father... I played Dardanella so long the fuzz on the turntable came through. <laughs> but, Father... And stop butt-fathering me. You have no right to waste $7.50 on records. But, Father, I didn't. I borrowed them from Janie Liggett. I don't care where you got them. You have no right to... Oh. <laughs> well, uh, where was I? A rainy day, dear. Page two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, laugh. Go ahead. The whole thing is a big joke. It's very funny. 
that. I'm telling you right now, we're spending too much money, and we're going to cut down. Oh, Jim, I don't think we're extravagant, any of us. Okay, you're not extravagant. You just spend too much money. But we don't waste anything, dear. And we don't spend money unnecessarily. Oh, we don't, don't we? I suppose $5 to watch birds isn't unnecessary. If Bud has to watch birds, he can sit on the front porch and watch them for 10 years. It won't cost him a dime. <laughs> Holy cow. This family has to learn to conserve. We've got to make things do. Now, here, look at this. Another pair of shoes for Kathy. That's the third pair in six months. But, Daddy, I'm growing. Well, do you have to grow so fast? <laughs> Father! Oh, it's all right, dear. Your father's only joking. Sure, I'm only joking, Kathy. But there's one thing I'm not joking about. This family has to stop spending so much money. And we've got to stop running around. We're going to stay home and enjoy the simple things of life. We've got magazines to read, books to read. I spent $190 for the encyclopedia. And nobody's ever gotten past Marib to Mushy. <laughs> Jim, there's one thing you don't seem to understand. Just a moment, dear. Bud, the phone. It's Cassie's turn. It is not. But I'll answer it anyway. See if I care. What is it you were saying, Margaret? Well, I was saying that there's one thing you don't seem to understand. That no one has even mentioned going out tonight. Everyone was quite satisfied and quite happy in this... Entire discussion seems to be absolutely pointless. Is that so? If I didn't put my foot down every once in a while, this whole family would go to pot. Nobody would ever stay home. Daddy, it's for you. Thank you, Kathy. It's Mr. Smith, Daddy. Thank you, dear. Hello, Heck. No, we were just finishing our dinner. The drugstore? Well, I hadn't thought about going down there, but... Pick up cards for what? You mean the game is tonight? Oh, well, uh... Look, heck, uh, maybe you'd better not figure on me for tonight. Well, frankly, I forgot all about it, and I got myself into a situation here. Yes, I know, heck, but couldn't you get George Phillips? Out of town, huh? Uh, just a minute, heck. Kathy, there's somebody at the door. Sorry, Hank. Well, look, there must be somebody else you can get for the game. There isn't, huh? Well, uh, I'll do whatever I can, Heck, but uh, it's going to be tough. Okay. Okay. But if I'm not there by eight, well, uh, you'd better call me. Okay, Heck, I'll see you. Ye gods, the things I get myself into. Is there anything wrong, dear? No, nothing wrong. Let's see, um... What were we talking about? Nobody goes out tonight. <laughs> well, of course, I don't mean that we have to live like hermits. Of course not, dear. There are circumstances when it will be necessary and proper for us to spend an evening away from home. A special picture that we won't want to miss, or a meeting, or uh, uh, something. You're so right, dear But after that long lecture you just finished Naturally, you don't mean tonight Do you, dear? Oh, no, naturally not tonight <laughs> we, uh, We'll all spend a quiet evening at home Tonight <laughs> Daddy Yes, Kathy? Daddy, may I please have a dollar and a quarter? You certainly may not But, Daddy You see, Margaret, that's just what I meant about discipline this entire discussion about thrift and economy was absolutely wasted. Everything I said went in one ear and out the other. I spent 15 minutes explaining that we had to take it easy, that we had to cut down on our spending, and what happens? As soon as I stop to take a deep breath, Bud needs $5 to watch birds, and Kathy needs a dollar and a quarter. Now, why on earth do you suddenly need a dollar and a quarter? To pay the paper boy. <laughs> Oh. You know, for all his talking, Father wouldn't think of doing without that paper. It's one of those things that means so much to every day that comes along. 
And something else we count on, you and I, day in and day out, is coffee. I mean really good coffee, like our Maxwell House. Coffee you sit down to and enjoy, cup after cup. That good-to-the-last-drop flavor. You won't find it in any other coffee. No coffee but Maxwell House. And as you'd expect, there's a very real reason why. It's a recipe. The only recipe there is for that good-to-the-last-drop flavor. It's mighty important, that recipe of ours. Because the flavor of the coffee you enjoy depends on the blend, the kind of coffees in it, and how they're put together. Now, coffee grows in many different varieties, and you can blend them in all sorts of ways. But there's only one way, one recipe for our famous Maxwell House flavor. And when all said and done, it's this recipe of ours that makes the difference, the big difference between just another coffee and the wonderfully good flavor of America's favorite brand. It's a difference you'll taste for yourself the very first time you pour a cup of our Maxwell House coffee. And I hope you will, tomorrow. Hope you'll start enjoying the coffee that's always good to the last drop. In the white frame house on Maple Street, an hour has passed, and a long, long hour it's been. For Jim Anderson, the minutes have dragged by an endless procession. His active mind is buzzing with a weird assortment of masculine schemes, every one of them taken from the file headed, How to Get Out of the House. A dozen fantastic plans have already been tried, and none of them has worked. But you've got to give Jim credit. The kid's still in there pitching like this. Margaret. Yes, dear? Do you have the correct time? Oh, I think so. It's, um, five minutes of eight. Uh-huh, just what I thought. This doggone watch is on the blink again. Just won't keep time. Well, what time do you have, dear? Seven of. <laughs> well, Jim, that's a difference of only two minutes. Only two minutes? Margaret, do you realize the things that have happened in two minutes? Wars have been won and lost. The entire course of civilization has been changed. I, uh... I better have it fixed. All right, dear. As a matter of fact, as long as I'm not doing anything right now, I might as well run down to the jewelers. And, uh... It might take some time. You know how fussy jewelers can be about a watch. So, uh, maybe you'd better not wait up for me. Jim. Yes, dear? Christmas is over. The jewelers all close at 5.30. They do. <laughs> you mean, uh, all of them? Yes, dear. Oh. You ought to see the, the watch Joe Phillips got for Christmas, Dad. Boy, is that a watch. Shatterproof, shockproof, waterproof, heatproof... And it's guaranteed to last him a lifetime. But it won't. Why not? He lost it. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of making bad jokes, why don't you go upstairs and do your homework? That wasn't a joke, Dad. You can say that again. <laughs> you mean the whole thing? But... <laughs> go upstairs and do your homework. Okay. You, uh... You wouldn't want to help me, would you? That's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of figured you wouldn't. Well, I'll see you later. Margaret, uh, I think I'll go out for a little walk. Why, Jim, it's snowing. Well, there's nothing wrong with a little snow. Does a man good to get out in the snow once in a while? The air crisp and clear, the ground all white. Peaceful. Jim Anderson, you're not going to tramp around in the snow at your age. I have enough to do without taking care of a sick husband. Uh... And stop pacing up and down the room like a caged lion. Father. Yes, Betty? I'll play checkers with you if you like. Thank you. But I'd rather see you doing your homework. Oh, I don't have any homework. I finished it this afternoon. Well, go sew something. <laughs> Or uh, read a book. And don't tell me you read a book. I'll spot you two kings. I don't need to be spotted two kings, and I don't want to play checkers. Um, Margaret. Yes, dear? Do you need anything at the drugstore? <laughs> no, dear, not a thing. We, uh, we're kind of low on toothpaste this morning. I got some this afternoon. <laughs> oh, you did. 
Uh, soap holding up all right? Just fine. Uh-huh. Say, I think I'll run out and get something to smoke. Yes, sir, that's just what I'll do. Jim. Yes, Margaret? I bought you a carton of cigarettes this afternoon, and there's a whole humidor full of pipe tobacco. I... Uh, you know, it's a funny thing, but I just feel like smoking a cigar. <laughs> Jim, I didn't know you smoked cigars. Well, of course. After all, there's nothing like a good cigar. You know what Rudyard Kipling said, a woman is only a woman, but a good cigar is a smoke. Yeah, I'll get it. Uh, Jim, be careful. Oh, oh. <laughs> ah, who the dickens moved the lamp over to this side? Oh, Jim, how could you? Well, how do you expect me to keep track of where the lamps are if you keep moving them around all the time? Anyway, well, I'm sorry, Margaret. I was just... The phone's ringing. Betty, be a good girl and clean up this mess, will you? All right, Father. And don't worry about the lamp, Margaret. We'll get it fixed or something. A good lamp. Just look at it. Sticks lamps right in your way when you're in a hurry. Naturally, they get knocked down. <laughs> hello? Hey, hello, Heck. What do you mean, am I still here? Of course not. I left for your house 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Heck, I'm doing everything I can. I can't do it, Heck. I can't just walk out. Because I can't, that's why. I am trying. Well, stop worrying about it. I'll figure something out. Okay. Yeah, call me later. So long. Who is that, dear? It was Hector, honey. He uh, just... Uh, wanted to uh, talk to me. About what, dear? Is anything wrong? Oh, no. He uh, wanted me to come over there. He probably wants to talk to me about uh, uh, something. <laughs> like what, dear? Well, he... Uh, it, uh, well, it's probably very complicated. <laughs> you, uh, you'd be surprised. I'll bet I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, are you through with the newspaper, dear? Yeah, I think so. Well, I guess I'll sit down and read the paper. <laughs> That's a very good idea. Daddy. We're in the den, Kathy. Daddy, I just thought of something wonderful to save money. How much does water cost? Not very much, dear. Why? Well, it costs something to get it hot, doesn't it? So I thought if I only took one bath a week... Are you supposed to be taking a bath now? Uh-huh. Well, take it. <laughs> But you said we had to save money, and I thought if I only took... Kathy, go upstairs and take your bath. Gee whiz. You heard your father, Kathy. Now go ahead. First they want to save money, then they don't want to save money. Why don't they make up their minds? Say, did you see this in the paper? They're having a big meeting in the school auditorium. Tomorrow night. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. It's uh, tomorrow. Jim. Father, I put all the broken pieces on the service porch, but I don't think they can fix the lamp. It's a mess. Thank you, Benny. You're welcome. Were you going to say something, dear? Oh, no, no, it's all right. Mother. Yes, Betty. Have you seen the records I borrowed from Janie? Well, no, dear, I haven't. Where did you leave them? Well, I put them over there on Father's chair. <gasps> Father, you're sitting on them. I am? <laughs> oh, I... <laughs> Thought it felt kind of funny. Oh, Father, how could you? Seven dollars and fifty cents worth of South Pacific, and look at it. Well, they're, they're only cracked a little, Betty. <laughs> well, look at this one. Only the front part of it's broken off. <laughs> you can still play the whole chorus, and that's all anybody listens to anyway. She'll never talk to me again, and I don't blame her. Oh, well, Betty, will you please stop that moaning and groaning? I'll buy Janie another album. And stop looking at me as though I went around beating little children. Yes, Father. Man tries to spend a quiet evening at home, and what happens? Lamps fall down, people stuff records under his cushion. Uh, I'll get it. Uh, Jim, please be careful. Margaret, I don't make a practice of knocking lamps down. Anybody listening to you would think I broke a lamp every day. Yes, dear, but be careful just the same. Never liked a darn lamp anyway. Silliest looking lamp I ever saw in my life. Hello? Yes, I'm still here. <laughs> Look, Heck, I told you in the very beginning I didn't think I could make it. Well, I did try. I tried everything but chloroform. <laughs> it 
It won't do any good to call me back later. Why don't you just forget the whole thing? Jim! Just a minute, Hector. Uh, what is it, Margaret? Is that Hector again? Yes, dear, it's, uh, uh, Hector. Well, Jim, if it's really that urgent, why don't you run over there? You, uh, you wouldn't mind? No, but if they can't get anyone else, why don't you have them come over here for the game? <laughs> Game. Over here? Well, there's no reason why they can't play poker here. Uh, there isn't? Of course not. Oh. Well, uh, say, heck, how about playing over here? It would, huh? Well, fine. Oh, of course not. Margaret won't mind at all. Okay, see you in a little while. Goodbye. Margaret. Yes, Jim? I, uh... Well, you see, I'd forgotten all about this date I had with the boys, and, uh, well, I told them to get somebody else, In just else, a moment, but, dear. Uh... Bud! You want me, Mom? Yes, dear. I want you to go to the delicatessen. Okay, I'll be down in a minute. Why does he have to go to the delicatessen? Well, you'll be busy getting the card things ready, dear, and there isn't a thing in the house. We'll have to serve something. Well, it doesn't have to be anything elaborate. Oh, no, but we'll need a few slices of ham and some liverwurst and bologna and cheese, a few loaves of bread, potato chips, pickles. Why do we need pickles? <laughs> <laughs> There's no sense in running hog wild just because a couple of men are coming over to play poker. I told you at dinner, Margaret, we've got to cut down on our expenses. All right, dear, no pickles. <laughs> After all, father knows best. <laughs> well, pickles or no pickles, I'm inclined to think it's mother knows best when it comes to shopping for the family groceries. I take coffee, for instance. Mother knows that when she buys coffee, there's just one thing that means real value. It's the flavor you get for your money that really counts. And these days, she understands it's more important than ever to get the most flavor for every penny you spend. And that's just what you do get in our Maxwell House coffee. You get a full measure of that wonderful Maxwell House flavor. Good to the last drop flavor no other coffee gives you. And that's why more people buy our Maxwell House than any other brand of coffee. So when you put out good money for coffee... Be sure you get the most in value, in flavor and freshness. You always will when you open up a pound of Maxwell House, the coffee that's always good to the last drop. The lights are out in the white frame house on Maple Street. The children are asleep, the guests are gone. The last chip has been put away, and the poker game is a thing of the past. Jim. Oh, you're still awake, dear? Yes, I've just been lying here thinking. How did the game go? Fine, just fine. <laughs> I guess I showed that Hector Smith how poker should be played. Bluffed him right out of two of the biggest pots you ever saw. Jim. Yes, dear? You know, I've been wondering about this sudden wave of economy. There isn't anything wrong, is there? Oh, no. I, well, it was those darn Christmas bills. They really got me down. <laughs> Tonight didn't help much, did it? I mean, we'll have to buy a new lamp and records for Janie. Well, it won't amount to much. No, I suppose not. Including the food and drinks, I figure that the quiet evening at home came to just thirty-two fifty. <laughs> Thirty-six fifty. No, dear. Uh, $32.50. I can get a new lamp for... Oh. You mean you... I certainly did. $4? And 22 cents. <laughs> Good night, Mark. Good night, dear. <laughs> If you 
like good things the easy way. Good things the easy way. Instant Maxwell House, that's for you. Good, good coffee that's easy too. No time, no trouble, no grounds, no pot. And it's good to the very last, you know what? Yes, Instant Maxwell House means great coffee instantly in your cup. Here's real instant coffee. All pure Maxwell House coffee in instant form. Enjoy instant Maxwell House. Instantly. Good to the very last you know what. Join us again next week when we'll be back with Father Knows Best, starring Robert Young as Jim Anderson, with Roy Bargey and the Maxwell House Orchestra, and yours truly, Bill Foreman. Don't forget, membership cards for the Robert Young Good Drivers Club are waiting for you at your local NBC station. Get a man-to-man or dad-to-daughter pledge and sign up today. Be a good driver. Get your membership card in the Robert Young Good Drivers Club today. Now until next Thursday, good night and good luck from the makers of Maxwell House, America's favorite brand of coffee. Always good to the last drop. Father Knows Best was transcribed in Hollywood and written by Ed James. Now stay tuned in for Screen Guild Theater, which follows immediately over most of these stations. Here are three top stars on Screen Guild Theater, next on NBC. Mother, is Maxwell House the best coffee in the whole world? Well, your father says so, and your father knows best. Yes, it's Father Knows Best, transcribed in Hollywood, starring Robert Young as father. A half-hour visit with your neighbors, the Andersons, brought to you by Maxwell House. The coffee that's bought and enjoyed by more people than any other brand of coffee at any price. Maxwell House, always good to the last drop. This is the time of year, I think, when most people become restless. The weather's bad, summer vacations are a long way off. It's one of those times when you wish you could just get away from it all for a while. Spend a weekend in the country and relax. Well, before you get any such ideas, let's stop off in Springfield at the white frame house on Maple Street and see how the Andersons were affected one fine Friday by a notion just like that. Like this. Mother, if you'd only speak to Father about it. I'm sorry, Betty, but I don't think it's a good idea. Gee whiz. All right, Kathy, stop playing with your cereal and drink your milk. Well, it isn't as though we wanted something stupendous. Creepers, Janie Liggett's father takes them all the time. I know, dear, but the Liggett's have more money than we do. Joe Phillips' father isn't any richer than we are, and they've been away twice. Everybody can have fun but us. All we ever do is stay home and drink milk. (laughs) Well, of course, there's uh, another way of doing it. If it's so terribly important, why don't you ask your father? You mean... me? I mean all of you. All he can do is say no. Mother's absolutely right. As soon as father comes down, we'll have Bud ask him. Oh, good! Why do I have to ask him? It was your idea. That's right. Leave all the dirty work to me. You always do anyway. Now, Betty, if Bud doesn't want to do it... He never wants to do anything. Is that so? Yes, that's so. I do more around here than you and Kathy put together. Oh, you do not. I do, too. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, morning, darling. Who carries the garbage out? I do. Who takes care of the ashes? I do. Good morning, Bud. I work harder than any kid in this neighborhood, and you know it. Bud... When there's grass, I have to cut it. (laughs) Leaves, I have to rake them. Sidewalks, I have to sweep them. Bud. Every time it snows, who gets handed a shovel? Me. Every time someone has to go to the store, who gets called? Me. Bud. Any time there's a... (laughs) Any time that there's a... Bud. Yes, Dad? Good morning. Good morning, Dad. 
That's better. Now, as soon as your mother hands me my coffee... There you are, dear. Thank you. You may tell me the reason for that impassioned recitation of sterling, if highly questionable, accomplishment. Huh? What's the beef, bud? Well, Betty said that I ought to ask you, and I just said I wouldn't. In a few million well-chosen words. Well, gosh, why should I? It was her idea in the first place. What was? What we were talking about. What were you talking about? Betty's idea. Uh, Let's start all over again from the beginning. Good morning, bud. Good morning. Beautiful day, isn't it? Uh, Jim, dear... Just a moment, Margaret. I'm trying to sneak up on this thing. What thing, dear? Margaret, please, one at a time. (laughs) All right, bud. Betty had an idea, and you don't see why you should, because when it snows, you have to run errands with a shovel. Then what? Is that what I said? (laughs) I'll get your cereal, dear. Thank you. Father. Yes, Betty? Father, we were thinking, well, that is, we all thought, well, what I mean is, it'd be just as good for you. It would? Oh, of course. And you'd probably have a much better time than anybody. Where? What? Where would I have this wonderful time? Of where we were talking about. I see. Good morning, bud. (laughs) Good morning, Dad. Beautiful day, isn't it? Uh, Jim. Margaret, if you'll just have a little patience, please. I got a lot closer that time. (laughs) Well, gee whiz, if somebody doesn't ask him, I'll be late for school. Uh, Would it ease the situation if I said no without anybody asking me? Oh, Well, I was just trying to help. Oh, here you are, dear. Nice hot cereal. Mmm, smells wonderful. Cream and sugar, bud, please. Okay, Dad. Thank you. Father. Daddy. Dad. Yes? We were just wondering. Do you suppose it'd be all right? Just this one. If we all went away to the mountain? For the weekend. Is that the question? Yes. Yes. No. (laughs) Mmm, tastes good, too. Gee whiz. You see, kids, it wasn't hard at all, was it? All you have to do is speak right up. But you said no. That's right. Holy cow. Joe Phillips didn't even want to go to the mountains, and his father took him. Good. The Liggetts go practically every weekend, and they have a wonderful time. Fine. Everybody goes except us, and we don't ever get to go any place. You know, it's a funny thing. We've got a comfortable home, warm, clean, practically bulging with modern conveniences, but is anybody satisfied? No. No. You'd rather spend the weekend shivering in some flea trap in the woods. <laughs> but, Father, it's fun. Sure. Why this sudden passion for the mountains? What's the matter with Springfield? Well, gosh, we want to get out in the snow. What do you think that is in the backyard? Confetti? <laughs> <laughs> we mean lots of snow, Father. Millions of bushels of snow. Okay, I'll talk to Ed Davis and see if we can borrow some of theirs. <laughs> Father, I've got a brand new ski suit and I've never even worn it. And what good are my skates? And what good is a sled without hills? And they don't have any big hills in Springfield. They keep all the hills in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> Look, kids, you don't think I like to say no, do you? It's just that, well, uh, we can't afford it. It doesn't cost very much, Father. Really, it doesn't. Betty knows a place near Crestline where you can rent a cabin for practically nothing. And it doesn't even have water in it. So look at the money we'd save on soap. (laughs) (laughs) Margaret, will you explain to them... It's right on the edge of a lake, Father. And, And you can even rent an ice boat. And the hills are 800 miles long. Why is it that I always have to be the villain? Everybody seems to think I stay awake nights Trying to figure out ways to make my family miserable Oh, you know we don't, Jim It's just that this would be so much fun for the children But it wouldn't, Margaret That's what I'm trying to tell you I know those little cabins you can get for practically nothing They're one-room shanties with no improvements Except built-in pneumonia But Joe Phillips told me Joe Phillips was sick for a week after their last trip, wasn't he? Well, sure, And his father was flat on his back for two weeks. I know, Dad, but... Nothing happened to Mrs. Phillips. How can you tell? (laughs) 
Helen Phillips could have a galloping case of sleeping sickness and nobody would ever know the difference. <laughs> Jim, please. Well, I'm just trying to explain. Janie Liggett's family goes to a place. Betty. Yes, Father? We are not the Liggetts. I know, Father, Nobody but... can afford to do what the Liggetts do. But, Father... And that includes the Liggetts. <laughs> Father, if you'll only let me tell you. Tell me what? We don't mind roughing it for a few days, do we? Heck no. Gosh, it'd be worth getting pneumonia. Kathy. Well, wouldn't it? It may be that I have very old-fashioned ideas, but I believe that a father has certain obligations to his family, and keeping them alive happens to be one. Now, let's not talk about it anymore. I'll be 50 years old before I get a chance to use my sled. Well, fine, you can take your grandchildren for a ride <laughs> Daddy, you're silly I am, huh? Sure, they'll have their own slabs <laughs> Margaret, Margaret Why, Jim, what have you been home this early? It isn't even four o'clock Margaret, wait till you hear what happened where are the kids? Well, the... Father. Well, come on down. We're going to the mountains. We're what? Most amazing thing you ever heard. Oh, but, Jim, I thought you said that Wouldn't you... happen once in a million years. But, but Jim, I... Oh, oh, you oh, to the mountains. All right, right on, let's on. calm down. Everybody take it easy. Father, what happened? Well, Mr. Gribble came into my office this afternoon, and we, well, we were discussing families and children, and first thing you know, I told him how I was letting mine down. Oh, Jim, dear, you aren't really. Well, I'm not now. Mr. Gribble says we can use his hunting lodge. A hunting lodge? Holy cow. Wait till I tell Janie Liggett. Well, Jim, I thought you didn't want to go to the mountains. Margaret, I didn't want to go to one of those shacks the kids were talking about. But Gribble's hunting lodge, well, that's a different story. You can just imagine what kind of a place he has. Oh, Father, you're wonderful. You're just the most wonderful father anybody ever had. And how? Well, don't just stand there. Go on upstairs and pack. Pack? Jim, you don't mean now. Of course I mean now. If we want to get there before dark, we've got to leave ten minutes ago. <laughs> Takes over two hours to get there. But I can go now, Father. I have a date tonight and tomorrow night. So have I. Well, if this isn't... You said you wanted to go to the mountains, didn't you? Sure, but we didn't mean today. Holy cow. <laughs> Jim, we can't possibly go on such short notice. Well, uh, our clothes aren't ready, and, and we have to buy food. Gribble said the place was loaded with food. And what kind of clothes do you need? Shove a couple of sweaters in a suitcase, and you're all set. What'll I tell Billy Smith and Dick Andrews? What'll I tell Joe Phillips? I don't care what you tell them. I told Mr. Gribble we'd be happy to use his hunting lodge, and we're going to use it. I don't want to go to the mountains. <laughs> I thought you wanted to use your sled. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Father, you don't even like the mountains. I love the mountains. You said it wasn't any fun. I'm starting to have fun right now, see? <laughs> <laughs> but you said we'd all get pneumonia. I don't care if we all get double pneumonia. You said you wanted to go to the mountains, and you're going to the mountains if I have to drag you. Well, let's start packing. After all... I know. Father knows best. <laughs> well, like it or not, the family's going to take that trip to the mountains. We'll see how they fare in just a moment. But right now, ladies, with all coffee prices high these days, it really pays to remember Maxwell House is true economy. Yes, and here's how one lady found that out. When coffee prices went up, she started shopping around, thinking she could find a cheaper coffee that would do. But when she brought one home, her husband turned thumbs down. Too weak, he said. So she put a lot more in the pot. But still her husband wouldn't drink it up. It may be strong now, he told her, but the flavor's all wrong. This coffee just doesn't have what it takes. And meal after meal, leftover coffee went to waste. Then she realized Maxwell House is true economy. Sure it is. 
because you get so many more truly good cups of coffee from every pound. Discover the wonderful difference that vacuum packing means, the extra freshness and clear, rich taste. See how much more your husband and you enjoy that wonderful flavor. So good to the last drop, you drink every drop. You'll say Maxwell House is true economy. So get your money's worth and more. Remember, in your cup, on your table, Maxwell House is true economy. Always good to the last drop. Well, a few peaceful hours have gone by, and on the edge of a quiet mountain road, white with new fallen snow, we find the Andersons. The air is crisp and clear, and because of the altitude, just a trifle thin. Maybe that's why poor Jim is puffing just a little. Or perhaps there's another reason, like this. Okay, bud. When I give you the word, give it the gas. Okay, Dad. Are you ready? You bet. Well, let's go. Okay, bud, that's enough. You say something, Dad? I said that's enough. Turn it off. Okay. No good country roads. I was getting stuck. Didn't work, huh, Dad? No, it didn't work. Now we're good and stuck. Well, Father, I told you we were going off the road. You told me. Everybody's always telling me. Look at the tree. Look at the sky. Look, look, look. How do you expect me to see anything? <laughs> but, but we aren't I... off the road. We're still on the road. We're halfway through the road. Oh, dear, maybe we ought to go back home. Margaret, how are we going to go anywhere? We're stuck. Well, I mean, after we get out. Well, let's worry about it when we get out. If we get out. I'm hungry. <laughs> now, let's not start that again, Kathy. But I am. Jim, I told you we should have brought some food. Well, how did I know we were going to get stuck? We should have been there an hour ago. Bud. You want me, Dad? No, I just want to hear your name. <laughs> it's such a beautiful name, so warm and friendly. Holy cow, now what did I do? <laughs> Nothing. Come on out here and help me push. Okay. The chains won't take, huh, Dad? I don't know what it is. It doesn't seem to be the snow so much. I think we got into some kind of a hole. Doggone thing looks like the Grand Canyon. Uh, Betty? Yes, Father? Slide over and back of the wheel. Daddy! Just a minute, Kathy. Put it in low, and when I give you the signal, let the clutch out fast. Do you understand? I suppose so. <laughs> well, there's nothing so complicated about it. Daddy! What is it, Kathy? Somebody's coming. Well, good for us. Maybe now we'll get out of here. Hello there. Hey. <laughs> I said hello. Uh, we're stuck in the snow. Having a little trouble? Yes, we're uh, stuck in the snow. No, huh? Sure looks like you're having trouble. <laughs> we are. We're stuck. Hey. Eh? <laughs> I said we're stuck. Uh, can you pull us out with your tractor? Actors, huh? <laughs> oh, see many of them up here in the wintertime. I didn't say we were actors. We want you to pull us out of the snow. Putting on a show, huh? <laughs> no. Good for you. <laughs> Will you please turn that thing off? Eh? I said turn the motor off. Turn it off. When I turn this darn thing off, can't hear you. <laughs> now, well, what is you saying, young feller? I said we're stuck in the snow. Well, I... you don't have to shout. I ain't deep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. We, uh, we'd appreciate it very much if you'd pull us out. Ooh, stuck in the snow, huh? <laughs> yes, we certainly are. Well, yeah, won't be much of a job. Where are you putting on the show? I told you before, we're not actors. No? No. Well, then what are you doing putting on a show? <laughs> You're not putting on a show. I never even mentioned a show. I said we were stuck in the snow. Oh, snow. I thought you said show. No. Oh. 
Well, don't make much difference. Never go anyway. Here, grab onto this tow rope. All right. Want me to hook it up, Dad? Yeah, go ahead, bud. I'll wrap it around the bumper a couple of times. You better hook it onto the frame, bud. Okay. I sure could have sworn you said you was actors. <laughs> no, we're just up here for the weekend. A friend of ours is letting us use his hunting lodge. Maybe you know him, J.P. Gribble? Gribble? Nope, can't say to do. What's he look like? Well, he's rather large, has a very deep voice, about yeah. 50 years old, very dignified. Hey, you mean the feller comes up from Springfield, fat's old. <laughs> yes, he lives in Springfield Well, you ain't gonna get to Fat Soul's place this way I'm not? No, sir, you're heading down to the lake Oh Yes, you took the wrong turn back at the corners I see, uh, is it uh, very far from here? No, won't take you more than 20 or 30 minutes I'll show you a special shortcut Save you three or four miles anyway <laughs> How you doing, son? I think I've just about got it. Okay, I'm out from under there. Hurry up, bud. You've been very kind, and I want you to know we appreciate it. Oh, shucks. It ain't hardly nothing. <laughs> what are people for if not to help one another? If you can't be neighborly, I always say you might just as well go someplace and lay down. <laughs> and that's all I'm doing is being neighborly. Well, it isn't everybody who would go to all this trouble for complete strangers. It's all set. Okay, son. Well, I'll have you yanked out of there in no time now. Thank you. You'll never know how grateful we are. Oh, that's okay. Would you like to give me the money now? We... <laughs> what? Well, it ain't that I don't trust you, but these here tractors don't go very fast. A couple of fellas got away slick as a whistle. Oh. Weren't very uh, neighborly, huh? Not so as you could notice it. Well, hand up the $15 and we'll get going. $15? Hi, ain't it? Why, it's outrageous. Yeah, I know. But don't forget, I got a split with a fella what dug the hole. <laughs> Stopping, Jim? Oh, it's no sense going any further. I can't even see the road. Boy, it's sure snowing. I'm hungry. <laughs> Father, I told you we were on the wrong road. We are not on the wrong road. He said turn left after the small bridge and then right at the fort. But he said two miles and you went almost five. Well, I have a very silly habit. When I make a turn, I like it to be on a road. <laughs> or would you rather go floating around in somebody's cornfield? Oh, Jim, please don't get upset. I'm not getting upset, but we're not lost. Well, where are we? How do I know? <laughs> Stop asking silly questions. Dad. What? Do you see something out there? Where? Over there, in back of those trees. Father, it's a house. I don't see any... Oh, that's no house. It looks more like a cattle shelter. Well, it's better than being cooped up in the car. My legs are paralyzed. I'm hungry. <laughs> Jim, we've got to do something. We can't sit here all night. Maybe someone lives here, Dad. They might know where Mr. Gribble's place is. All right, let's go ask him. Oh. Boy, that wind's cold. Well, don't just stand there. Let's go. Jim? Wait a minute, bud. Margaret, there's no need for you to come along. Well, if you don't mind, dear, we'd rather... Margaret, I'm perfectly capable of asking... Oh, you mean they might have some food. I'm hungry. <laughs> Right now, if I had to choose between a mink coat and a cup of coffee, I'd be reaching for the cream and sugar. Well, come on, Kathy. I'll carry you. Oh, thank you, Daddy. Let's go, bud. When I think of where I could be right now... Betty? Sitting in a nice warm movie, eating nice hot popcorn. Betty, this whole thing was your idea. My idea? And if I hear so much as one word of complaint out of you, so help me out... Paddle you bow-legged. Father, that's telling her, Daddy. That goes for you, too. Gee whiz. I wanted to stay home where it's warm and comfortable. No, we've got to be like the Liggetts and the Phillips. We've got to go to the mountains for the weekend. Look at this place. The worst-looking dump I've ever seen. The door's locked. Well, don't you think you ought to knock first? There's nobody inside, Dad. I looked through the window. 
Oh, dear, now what are we going to do? Bud, you've got heavy shoes on. See if you can kick the lock off the door. Oh, Jim, do you think... It's all right, Margaret. Go ahead, Bud. Okay, Dad. Don't kick it too hard. You might shove the whole building over. Gosh, that was easy. Don't feel too excited about it, Samson. (laughs) A large termite could have done the same thing. (laughs) Well, let's go on in. Now, there's nothing to be afraid of, Kathy. Go on in. Oh, Jim, isn't this place awful? Well, this is what they wanted. A weekend in the mountains. Aren't there any lights? No. And the bath is probably the first door on the left and 300 yards straight ahead. (laughs) Dad, here's a candle. Well, light it. Okay. Ah, What's the matter? There's a bear. Where? Up on the wall. Oh, oh for Kathy. <laughs> well, well, there is. And they chopped his head off. It's just a trophy, Kathy, probably shot by whoever owns this horrible joint. See, there's a plaque under it. Oh, I don't like it. Let me have the candle, bud. Here you are, Dad. Now, look, Kathy, there's nothing to it. See, it says, Black Bear, 840 pounds. Oh, no. Uh, Jim, what is it? December 1st, 1938, J.P. Gribble. So that's Mr. Gribble's hunting lodge. Looks like the family's got to make the best of a very poor bargain. And that brings up a mighty important point. Ladies, when you buy coffee, remember, Maxwell House is true economy. Sure, Maxwell House is true economy. Of course, you can find cheaper coffees if the price tag is all you consider. But just consider this. Is there any economy when you have to use lots more coffee to make it strong enough, yet even then you can't get the flavor you want? Is there any economy when the flavor is so lacking your family leaves coffee unfinished in the cup? Figure it out. You'll say Maxwell House is true economy. So many more cups of wonderfully good coffee in every pound. So rich and extra flavorful. So good to the last drop, you always want more. Yes, there's good reason why more people drink Maxwell House than any other brand at any price. Maxwell House is true economy. So tomorrow, get your money's worth and more. Get Maxwell House. Always good to the last drop. The horrible night is over at last. Now it's Saturday morning. The storm has passed, the sun is shining, and the entire world seems brighter and far more cheerful. To most people, that is. Good morning. Good morning, dear. Did you sleep well? Like a top. I'm still spinning. (coughs) Oh, my back... I'll never get it straightened out. Where are the kids? They're outside in the snow. Oh, they're having a wonderful time. See, you can see them through the window. I can see them through the wall. (laughs) Margaret, have you ever seen any place worse than this in your life? No, dear, I haven't. Hunting Lodge. Just wait till I see that guy gribble. Oh, he meant well, dear. You should have heard the build-up he gave it, too. Secluded, restful, the most beautiful view in the country. Well, there is a nice view, Jim. Sure, especially through the roof. Look at it. (laughs) Well, you'll feel better after a nice hot breakfast. Oh, you found the food, huh? Uh Uh-huh, a whole closet full. Good. I haven't eaten since noon yesterday. Well, what would you like? Some nice hot beans? Margaret, don't be ridiculous. I'll have eight dozen eggs and about 40 sausages. No sausages, dear. How about some nice hot beans? Oh, thank you. I'll just have eggs. No eggs, dear. How about some nice hot beans? Margaret, I don't like beans. Why can't I... Margaret. Yes, dear. You mean... Yes, dear. A whole big closet full of beans. Like good things the easy way. Good things the easy way. Instant 
Maxwell House, that's for you. Good, good coffee, that's easy too. No time, no trouble. No grounds, no fun. And it's good to the very last. You, you know, know what? Yes, instant Maxwell House means great coffee instantly in your cup. Here's real instant coffee. All pure Maxwell House coffee in instant form. Enjoy instant Maxwell House. Instantly. Good to the very last. You know what? Join us again next week when we'll be back with Father Knows Best, starring Robert Young as Jim Anderson, with Roy Bargey and the Maxwell House Orchestra, and yours truly, Bill Foreman. Don't forget, membership cards for the Robert Young Good Drivers Club are waiting for you at your local NBC station. Get a man-to-man or dad-to-daughter pledge and sign up today. Be a good driver. Get your membership card in the Robert Young Good Drivers Club today. Now until next Thursday, good night and good luck from the makers of Maxwell House, America's favorite brand of coffee. Always good to the last drop. Father Knows Best was transcribed in Hollywood and written by Ed James. Now stay tuned in for Screen Guild Theater, which follows immediately over most of these stations. Next, Barbara Stanwyck and Robert Taylor in Double Indemnity on NBC. Mother, is Maxwell House really the only coffee in the world? Well, your father says so, and your father knows best. Yes, it's Father Knows Best, transcribed in Hollywood, starring Robert Young as father. A half-hour visit with your neighbors, the Andersons, brought to you by Maxwell House, the coffee that's bought and enjoyed by more people than any other brand of coffee at any price. Maxwell House, always good to the last drop. All great men, it seems, are born on special days. Abraham Lincoln, for example, was born on Lincoln's birthday. Coincidence, isn't it? In Springfield, where Jim Anderson was born, they do things in a slightly different manner. So Jim shares his birthday with George Washington. That was yesterday, and in the white frame house on Maple Street, they had quite a time. It went something like this. Bud! You want me, Mom? Are you almost finished down there? Just about. I have to put up one more thing of balloons. Well, please hurry, dear. Your father will be home any minute. Okay. Did you get Mr. Gribble, Mother? Oh, dear, I knew there was something. He's the only one I couldn't reach. It's too bad because I know your father'd like him to be here. I bet Daddy's going to be surprised. Well, if he isn't, it won't be our fault. And if you say one word to him... Oh, I won't, Betty. I didn't this morning, did I? No, but you certainly came close a couple of times. And that dopey little smile you dug up. You look like the Mona Lisa, junior grade. (laughs) (laughs) What's that? Never mind. Betty, you know, I'm not sure that we did the right thing at breakfast. How's that, Mother? Well, your father looked so hurt. The least we could have done was wish him a happy birthday. Oh, no, Mommy. Mother, you're going to spoil everything. Father even said birthdays weren't important when you got to be his age. (laughs) I know, dear, but... And if he knows that we remembered his birthday, he might suspect something. Everything's all finished, Mom. Oh, that's fine, bud. Oh, you've done a wonderful job, all of you. And I haven't even said anything. Now, don't forget, Bud. You've got to get Father out of the house at 7.45. Yeah, I know. But holy cow, how am I going to do that? Bud, you don't want him to see the people when they come in, do you? It's a surprise party. But how am I going to get him out? Jumping creepers, you only have to get him out for 15 minutes. What's so hard about that? Well, if it's so easy, why don't you do it? Daddy's home. Oh, the sandwiches, Betty. Put them in the pantry. Okay. He isn't coming in here. Well, that's peculiar. I'd better go in and see. Jim? 
Yes? We thought we heard you come in, dear. Is anything wrong? No, nothing's wrong. Nothing important, anyway. Jim, you sound so strange. Hiya, Dad. What goes? Hi, Daddy. Hello. I'll be in the den when dinner's ready. Now, just a minute, Jim Anderson. You're not going to walk away from us like that. We didn't do anything. Oh, you didn't, huh? Jim, if there's anything wrong, we have a right to know what it is. You have a right to know what it is, do you? You haven't the faintest idea. All right, I'll tell you what it is. I don't ask for a great deal from this family. A minimum of respect and courtesy, that's all. But I certainly think that when a man's birthday comes around... <laughs> oh, Jim. Well, the least you can do is remember it. <laughs> Jim Anderson. And stop looking at me as though I had three heads. <laughs> <laughs> All of you. Isn't the least bit funny. Jim, darling, I was telling the children just before you got here that... Mother! Uh, uh, something's burning in the kitchen. Burning? Why, Betty, I turned up all... Oh. <clears throat> well, I'd um, better go and see what it is. <laughs> Man works hard for his wife and family and tries to give them all the advantages he can manage. What thanks does he get? They don't even remember his birthday. Holy cow, Dad, you said birthdays didn't mean anything. When did I say that? When you forgot moms. <laughs> <laughs> but I did not forget your mother's birthday. If you'll remember, I bought her the largest bottle of perfume in Springfield. Not that I expected you to buy anything for me, of course. Of course. I don't care anything about getting presents. I mean, even a small thing like a necktie or something. Dan. It isn't a gift. It's the thought behind it that counts. Dan. And it isn't as though it were a hard day to remember. I mean, like October 19th or August 64th or something like that. <laughs> Dan. But Washington's birthday, the easiest day of the whole year. How could you possibly forget? Dan. What is it, bud? Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. I'll get it, Father. Never mind, I'll answer it myself. Man has a birthday once a year, and nobody even remembers it. Fine thing. Hello? Oh, hello, Mr. Gribble. Yes, just fine, thank you. You what? What message? I didn't leave any message. To call me? Are you sure? Well, uh, just a minute, I'll ask Margaret. Uh, Margaret! Yes, dear? Did you call Mr. Gribble? Uh, what was that, dear? I said, did you call Mr. Gribble? Mr. Gribble? Why, uh, why should I call Mr. Gribble, dear? Margaret, the man's on the phone. He got a message to call us. I didn't leave any message. Well, Jim, what possible reason could I have for calling Mr. Gribble? If that isn't just like a woman. <laughs> All you had to say was no. Yes, dear. Hello, Mr. Gribble. Well, Margaret doesn't know anything about it. Uh-uh. Well, they probably got the name wrong. You know how it is. Oh, uh, by the way, New York sent me the revised figures on that compensation setup. All right, any time you say. No, I'll be free all evening. Eight o'clock? Fine. See you later. Jim, you're not going to meet Mr. Gribble tonight. Why not? Well, uh, it's your birthday. What's that got to do with it? My birthday certainly wasn't important a few minutes ago. Jim, I don't know how the children are going to feel about this. Father, we just had the most wonderful idea. Wait till you hear it, Dad. We're going to have a wonderful time, all of us. Now, just a minute. Your mother was about to tell me something. I know. I mean, she was? <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Jim. I, I guess it wasn't important. Well, you ought to know. What is it, Betty? Well, Father, even if we did forget your birthday, we're all very sorry. Yes? And we've decided to devote our entire evening to making you happy. Fine. I won't even be here. <laughs> but you can't go out, Father. You'll spoil everything. What do you mean? Well, um, uh, tell him, bud. What? Oh, oh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, we, uh, we had a lot of things, uh, figured out to do, Dan. Like what? Well, uh, we, uh, we thought that we'd, uh, play the radio. <laughs> he means games, Father. We'll all play games. Like spin the bottle. <laughs> oh, fine. 
I can't think of anything I'd enjoy more than a good, fast game of spin the bottle. (laughs) Unfortunately, I have to work. But you can't work, Father, not on your birthday. I worked all day. I know, but you can't work at night. New law, huh? (laughs) The man on the radio said it was gonna snow. Or rain, or... Something. (laughs) Margaret. Yes, dear? There seems to have developed a concerted and rather unusual desire for my company. How come? Well, frankly, Jim... Mother! We... Well, we hope that if we made your evening a pleasant one, you um, might forgive us for not remembering your birthday... We could even have a little celebration. Just the five of us. And we could make popcorn. And get some ice cream. It'd be just like a regular party, Daddy. Well... You'd make us all very happy, dear. I don't get it. If my birthday means that much to you... Oh, it does, Father. It sure does. Why did you forget it in the first place? We're stupid. Well, all right. I'll call Gribble and tell him we'll make it tomorrow. Gee, that's great, Dad. Would you like me to call him for you, Father? No, I'd better do it myself. He's certainly going to wonder if I've got all my buttons. Make an appointment and then cancel it five minutes later. I'm sure he'll understand, Jim. I wish I could be that sure. Hello, Mr. Gribble. Uh, This is Jim Anderson. Well, about that appointment for tonight, I, uh... You see, it's my birthday, and I... Well, I... I guess it slipped my mind. Yes. Well, uh, birthdays don't mean very much to me anymore, but, uh... Well, my family wants me to stay home with them. You know how it is. Yes. Uh, suppose I call you in the morning, Mr. Gribble. Right. What? Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, good night. <laughs> Well, I guess that takes care of that. Something wrong, Kathy? No, I was just thinking. About what? George Washington. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, uh, dinner about ready? Oh, just about, dear. I'd better go upstairs and wash. Fine family. One minute they don't even know it's your birthday, and the next they'll die if you leave them alone. Wow, that was a close one. Well, as long as he didn't leave, everything's going to be all right. And I didn't even say anything. (laughs) I know, dear. You were a very good girl. Say, Mom. Yes, bud? There's only one thing I don't understand. What's that, dear? We got him to stay home. Now how am I going to get him out? Well, Bud's got to figure that one out for himself. You know, we all do in lots of ways, as some of you may have found out just recently. About coffee in particular. Have you been shopping around more for your coffee since the price went up? Trying this brand and that in the name of economy? If you have, I'll bet lots of you have discovered this fact. Maxwell House is true economy. A friend of my wife's did. She was telling us just the other night. You see, when prices went up, she started buying cheaper coffee. Might not taste as good, she figured, but it ought to be more economical. First thing she found, though, it took lots more to make the breakfast coffee strong enough. And even then, the flavor just wasn't there. So meal after meal, her family would leave their cups unfinished. She said, that settled it for me. Maxwell House is true economy. Sure it is. Because you get so many more truly good cups of coffee from every pound. Just see how much more your family enjoys that wonderful Maxwell House flavor. So good to the last drop, they drink every drop. Discover the extra freshness, the clear, rich taste that's vacuum-packed in that familiar blue tin. You'll say Maxwell House is true economy. So get your money's worth and more. Get Maxwell House, always good to the last drop. (laughs) 
It's 7.45 in the white frame house on Maple Street, and time for Jim's surprise birthday party. With great effort, the Andersons have managed to keep father at home. Now, with the guests about to arrive, they can't get rid of him, like this. Dad. Yes, bud? After you finish the paper, uh, you wouldn't like to go down to the drugstore with me, would you? Why do you have to go to the drugstore? I don't. <laughs> hmm, I imagine you can explain that, but I'd just as soon you didn't. Well, I just thought that... Would you like to take a walk? No, thank you. Go for a ride? No, thank you. You want to clean out the garage? <laughs> but what's the matter with you? Nothing. I... Let's go sit upstairs in my room. <laughs> what for? Well, it, it's comfortable. <laughs> I'm quite comfortable right where I am. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. And stop fidgeting. Okay. Uh, excuse me, will you, Dad? Oh, sure. Whenever you're free, stop back and we'll figure out some more places I don't want to go. But <laughs> crying out loud, Betty, now what's the matter? You're supposed to have him out of here. It's a quarter of eight. But he won't go. He has to go. Everybody will be here any minute. Well, what do you want me to do about it? I can't hit him over the head. It's his birthday. <laughs> Bud, what's going on out there? Nothing, Dad. I'll be with you in a minute. You better go back, Bud, and see if he can't think of something. Where are you going? Back into the kitchen. <laughs> I've got to talk to Mom. This is getting desperate. Has your father gone, dear? No, he's sitting in there as big as life. A lot of help Bud turned out to be. Well, Betty, we may as well face it. We're not going to get your father out of the house. But we have to, Mother. It'll spoil everything. Maybe not. We can do it another way. I'll just put a note on the front porch asking everybody to come in the back way. But Daddy will hear them. Oh, I don't think so. He will, Mother. He's bound to hear them going down to the playroom. Not if you're all singing. Oh, that's an idea. Why do we have to sing? <laughs> so Father won't hear anything. It's a wonderful idea, Mother. Well, it's the best we can do. Margaret! Just a minute. Yes, Jim? What are you doing in there? Uh, we'll be finished in a few minutes, dear. Well, hurry up, will you, before Bud shoves me out the front door. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dear. Now, remember, girls, sing and loud if you hear anything. Now, I'll go around to the front and leave the note. All right, Mother. Come on, Kathy. Gee whiz. Why do we have to sing? I don't feel like singing. <laughs> Tell your father I'll join you in about five minutes. Okay, Mother. Betty, what are we going to sing? What difference does that make? Well, how can I sing loud if I don't know what I'm singing? <laughs> well... We'll sing the birthday song. We can't. That's what they're going to say at the party. Oh. How about for he's a jolly good fellow? Why? Because it's loud. <laughs> I know louder ones. That's loud enough. Hi, Father. We're going to sing. Hi, where's your mother? She said she'd be right in. Well, I guess I'd better... Daddy, uh, it isn't cold in here, is it? A little. Why? Oh, you can't feel cold. Dad says he wants to go down and look at the furnace. The furnace? Oh, no, it's hot. It's very hot. Isn't it, Kathy? <laughs> what is? <laughs> the house is hotter than it's ever been. It's roasting. I don't think so. <laughs> Father, please don't worry about the furnace. It's your birthday, and we're going to have all kinds of fun. Betty... You and Bud wouldn't have any bodies buried in the basement, would you? <laughs> bodies? <laughs> well, why would we want to put bodies in the basement? <laughs> we keep all our bodies in the attic, don't we, Bud? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we sure do. <laughs> Boy, that's a good one. <laughs> Kathy... Have they been like this all day? Who? 
<laughs> Betty and Bud. Why? I'm going inside to see your mother. No, you can't. Now, just a minute. I've had just about enough of this. What's going on around here? Oh, why nothing, Dad. We, uh, we just want you to have a good time. Well, if this is your idea of a good time... What was that? What was what? I didn't hear anything. Did you, Kathy? Oh, no! I distinctly heard somebody at the back door. Oh, uh, that was Mother. She, she took the garbage out. I took it out before. <laughs> Maybe she's bringing it back. How would you like to go to bed? <laughs> right now. Holy cow, Dad, all I said was... Father, we're supposed to be having a party, so why don't we all sing? We haven't done anything like that all winter. Well, you know, we haven't at that, by golly. That's a good idea. I said it before and nobody even listened. <laughs> well, we'll listen now, honey. Come on, Betty, you can play for us. All right, Father. Um, would you please get me a cushion from the couch? Gladly, Your Highness. Your slightest wish is my command. What's going on? Mother's bringing everybody in the back way. Oh. And we have to sing he's a jolly good fellow. Loud. Shh. One cushion coming up. There you are, Betty. Thank you, Father. This might turn out to be quite a party after all. Now, uh, what do we sing? Well, Betty said that... Kathy, be quiet. It's your birthday, Dad. Why don't you pick it? All right. How about, uh... For he's, he's a jolly good fellow. <laughs> he's a jolly good fellow. Wish nobody can deny. <laughs> what was that for? That's for your birthday, Dad. Oh, well, uh, thank you. Which Which nobody Well, that's very nice. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, how about down by the old mill street? It's kind of corny, isn't it, Dad? <laughs> it isn't very loud, either. <laughs> now, just a minute, both of you. It isn't your birthday, it's Father's. And if he wants to sing down by the old mill stream, why, that's what we'll sing. Right, Father? Right. For he's a jolly good Well, uh... Which nobody can deny! Nobody can deny! For he's a delicate fellow! For he's a delicate fellow! For he's a delicate fellow! Which nobody can deny! What happened to Down by the Old Minister? <laughs> we'll have lots of time for that, Father. We were... For he's a delicate fellow! For he's a delicate fellow! getting a little monotonous, isn't it? <laughs> Which nobody can deny. Which nobody can deny. For he's a delicate fellow. For he's a delicate fellow. For he's a delicate fellow. Which nobody can deny. Well, now that we've done down by the old mill street, <laughs> how about... Uh, For he's a delicate fellow. I said stop it, all of you. Stop it! Nobody can deny. <laughs> What's gotten into you? Don't you know how to sing anything else? But it's your birthday, Father, and that's so loud. <laughs> having a fine time. Margaret, what's the matter with these children? They're behaving like a bunch of lowercase lunatics. <laughs> well, I, um... My, isn't it chilly in here? Mother! Oh, but it is, dear. I think your father ought to go down and take a look at the furnace. You do? I certainly <clears throat> do. You mean we don't have to sing anymore? <laughs> Later, dear. I don't know. 
If this isn't the goofiest family in the United States, it certainly comes close. <laughs> yes, dear, but the furnace, remember? It's awfully chilly, Father. Oh, it is, is it? Five minutes ago, you were roasting. Well, I know, but, but now I'm cold. We're freezing. It won't take you a minute, Jim. Please take a look at it. Oh, for crying out loud. Don't be long, dear. I won't. Silliest darn family I've ever seen in my life. Stay home, go out. Fix the furnace, don't fix the furnace. Can't make up their minds, if any. I told them it was cold ten minutes ago. No, I have to do it their way. Everything has to be done the way they want it. Hmm. For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, which nobody can deny. Well, for goodness sake. <laughs> It's certainly been a mixed-up birthday for Father, but everything's straight now. You know, so often we seem to be in the midst of confusion, and then comes the light, which leads to this point. Ladies, with coffee prices higher today, remember Maxwell House is true economy. Yes, Maxwell House is true economy. Of course, you can buy cheaper coffees in the store, but are they really economical? There's no economy in coffee when you have to use lots more to get it strong enough. And even then, you can't get the flavor you want. There's no economy in coffee so stingy with its flavor, your family leaves their cups unfinished. But Maxwell House now, Maxwell House is true economy. So many more cups of wonderfully good coffee in every pound. So extra rich and full of flavor. So good to the last drop, it leaves you wanting more. Yes, there's real reason why more people drink Maxwell House than any other brand at any price. Maxwell House is true economy. Tomorrow, ask for Maxwell House. Get your money's worth and more with coffee that's always good to the last drop. It's quite late in the white frame house on Maple Street. Long past bedtime, as a matter of fact. The Anderson kids are sound asleep. But in the master bedroom, Jim and Margaret are busy with a pair of widely divergent thoughts. Like this. Oh, dear. Hmm, what? Oh, nothing, dear. I was just thinking of tomorrow. They made quite a mess, didn't they? Oh, I wouldn't worry about it too much. It was quite a party, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, dear, it certainly was. You know, in a way, I feel a little guilty. I mean, you and the kids had to work so hard. Oh, we didn't mind, dear. I know the children had a wonderful time surprising you so completely. Well... I wouldn't say it was a complete surprise. What was that, Mr. Washington? Hmm? Oh, well, I mean, after all, when the, uh, um... Margaret. Yes, dear? Have you ever seen anything more beautiful than those matched irons the kids gave me? No, dear. If I don't break 90 with those, I'll quit. <laughs> yes, dear. I'd have settled for a necktie, I really would. But those irons... Now, there's a birthday present I'll never forget. I know, dear. Must have cost the kids a fortune. Well, not exactly, dear. They kept watching for a sale at Gorman's. That was a good idea. And then they charged them. <laughs> oh. Good night, Margaret. Good night, dear. <laughs> Like good things the easy way. Good things the easy way. Instant Maxwell House, that's for you. Good, good coffee that's easy too. No time, no trouble, no grounds, no pot. And it's good to the very last, you know what? Yes, Instant Maxwell House means great coffee instantly in your cup. 
Here's real instant coffee. All pure Maxwell House coffee in instant form. Enjoy instant Maxwell House. Instantly. Good to the very last you know what. Join us again next week when we'll be back with Father Knows Best, starring Robert Young as Jim Anderson, with Roy Bargey and the Maxwell House Orchestra, and yours truly, Bill Foreman. Say, Bill. Yes, Bob? You won't forget about Saturday, will you? Oh, that's right. On Saturday, February 25th, Bob Young will be in Albany, New York, to attend a ceremony during which 2,000 young drivers and their parents are going to join the Robert Young Good Drivers Club and sign the man-to-man and dad-to-daughter agreements. Does that do it, Bob? Yes, except that there's going to be a parade, and if they're looking for me, I'll be the one sitting between Governor Dewey and Mayor Corny. See you on Saturday, Albany. That he will. And now until next Thursday, good night and good luck from the makers of Maxwell House, America's favorite brand of coffee, always good to the last drop. Father Knows Best was transcribed in Hollywood and written by Ed James. Now stay tuned in for Screen Guild Theater, which follows immediately over most of these stations. Next, Laura with the original cast on Screen Guild on NBC. Mother, is Maxwell House really the only coffee in the world? Well, your father says so, and your father knows best. Yes, it's Father Knows Best, transcribed in Hollywood, starring Robert Young as father. A half-hour visit with your neighbors, the Andersons, brought to you by Maxwell House, the coffee that's bought and enjoyed by more people than any other brand of coffee at any price. Maxwell House, always good to the last drop. You know, there are times when the poets come up with some pretty silly ideas. John Greenleaf Whittier wrote, for example, What moistens the lip and what brightens the eye? What calls back the past like the rich pumpkin pie? Well, in Springfield, in the white frame house on Maple Street, the Andersons have a very definite answer for him. And it has nothing to do with pumpkin pie. Like this. Frankly, Margaret, I think the whole idea is ridiculous. But, Jim, after all, I had to be pleasant. And he's only going to be in town for a few days. He sounded cute on the telephone. Kathy, be quiet and drink your milk. Gee whiz. (laughs) He hasn't been in Springfield for almost 20 years. Why does he suddenly have to come busting in and get everything all upset? He isn't getting anything upset, dear. I merely asked him to have dinner with us tonight. Why didn't you ask him to spend the weekend? We could have Bud sleep in the chandelier. (laughs) Jim, there's nothing wrong in asking him to dinner, is there? Why can't he eat in a restaurant? There's nothing wrong with eating in a restaurant once in a while. Why, Jim? When I have business in another town, you don't see me going around mooching dinners. And I had as many old girlfriends as he ever did. Oh, that's what it is. Oh, you mind your own business and eat your breakfast. The green-eyed monster rears his ugly head. Betty, in just about two seconds, the brown-eyed father's going to rear his ugly hand. Do you understand? Yes, father. And you'll eat standing up for a week. Yes, father. Jim, I really think you are jealous. Jealous? Me? I haven't got a jealous bone in my head. (laughs) But I don't see any reason for inviting him to dinner. Who, Dan? He was nothing but a pest 20 years ago, and you were glad enough to get rid of him then. Jim, that's not so. He was a very nice boy. Who was, Mom? Well, if he was so nice, why didn't you marry him? Who, Dad? (laughs) Because I loved you and I didn't love him, that's why. But he was still a very nice boy. Who was, Mom? (laughs) He was a big hunk of muscle, that's what he was. Didn't have a brain in his head. Jim, you're not being fair. Charlie was just as intelligent as any boy in your class. Charlie who, Mom? Just because he had a raccoon coat and a couple of silly letters on his sweater. So help me, Margaret, I can't understand what you were thinking of when you invited him to dinner. Who, Dad? 
<laughs> but don't you ever shut up. Oh, holy cow. Can I even know who you're talking about? No. Holy cow. <laughs> Eat your breakfast and be quiet. I know who they're talking about. <laughs> Kathy, behave yourself or go up to bed. I just got up. <laughs> well, behave yourself. Yes, Daddy. And sit still. Yes, Daddy. Man tries to have a peaceful breakfast with his family, and what happens? Nothing but noise and excitement and confusion. Jim, you're making a fuss over absolutely nothing. I'm not making a fuss, and it isn't absolutely nothing. How would you like it if I dragged all my old girlfriends in for a dinner? But, Jim, Charlie Warren is a happily married man. Charlie Warren? You mean the Charlie Warren who played football for Springfield? Yes, dear. Big C. <laughs> and the man runs around with a silly hunk of leather under his arm. But Charlie Warren, Dad, holy cow. Who's Charlie Warren? Who's Charlie Warren? You might just as well say, who's Red Grange? All right, who's Red Grange? <laughs> <laughs> Betty, it only happens that Charlie Warren is the greatest athlete in the history of Springfield, that's all. Oh, that. The way you said it, I thought he was somebody important. Would you care for some more toast, Betty? No, thank you, Father. Boy, just wait till I tell the fellas... Charlie Warren in my house. But if you'll take up a collection, maybe we can build a shrine. Jim. Make this place a national monument. Charlie Warren ate here. <laughs> Jim, I certainly hope you're going to be civil to the man. Oh, I'll be civil, all right. I'll be so civil he won't know I'm around. Well, I don't think that's necessary. Matter of fact, I won't even be around. I'll be in the den working on my income tax return with Hector. And I hope you and Charlie have a lovely time. Jim Anderson, you can't work on your income tax tonight. You just can't. Would you like to make a small wager? But, Jim, Charlie Warren is our guest. He's your guest, my pet. If you want to clutter up the house with your old boyfriends, go right ahead. I'm still going to work on my income tax. Jim, won't you please be sensible? I've already invited Charlie. I can't break the date now. Well, Hector's going out of town in the morning, and this is the last chance he has to help me with my tax return. And for your information, Charlie Warren runs a very poor second to my income tax. Now, if you'll be so good as to pour me a cup of coffee. Jim, if you really loved me... Oh, that's fine. That's just wonderful. Twist the whole thing around so it's my fault. I didn't say it was your fault, dear. All I said May was... May I please have my coffee? Of course, dear. Thank you. Jim, don't you think just this once... Margaret, this is your house. I bought it, furnished it, worked my fool head off to get it. But it's your home, and if you want boyfriends running in and out of the hallways... <laughs> Jim, you're being very unkind. Charlie Warren was your friend, too. My friend? <laughs> well, you certainly spend enough time with him. I had to. If I wanted to see you, I had to see him, too, didn't I? <laughs> I saw enough of him to last me a lifetime. Him and his big, fat football. <laughs> now you're being childish. Charlie was just as much your friend as he was mine. Oh, he was, was he? I suppose he asked me to marry him. <laughs> well, no, but... Mom, <laughs> you mean Charlie Warren asked you to marry him? We, yes, bud, he did. And you turned him down? <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow, Mom. If you could have married Charlie Warren... Oh. <laughs> You, uh, were about to say something? <laughs> James Anderson, Jr.? <laughs> uh, well, I, uh... <clears throat> uh... <laughs> Boy, it's sure hot in here. <laughs> What's so wonderful about being a football player? It doesn't take any brains to be a football player. Kick a ball, jump on somebody's neck. Don't even know which way they're running half the time. Hmm. Hiya, Jim. What you doing? Counting your money? Oh, hello, Hex. Sit down. Oh, I've already had lunch. Well, sit down anyway. What's the matter? Something wrong? Uh... uh maybe we'd better not work on your tax return tonight. That isn't going to make you feel any better, you know. Hex... Do you remember Charlie Warren? Charlie Wa 
Oh, you mean Big Charlie, the flapper's favorite? Flapper's favorite. Oh, gosh, I haven't seen him in... Well, must be 20 years. Why? What about him? He's in town. He is? Well, what do you know? What's he doing here? Eating at my house. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He was a friend of yours, wasn't he? He was not. Well, when you and Margaret were... Oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Big football phony. Comes into town, gets everybody all excited. <laughs> Giving you a bad time around the house. Oh, huh? you ought to hurt him. Bud can't even figure out why his mother married me. <laughs> ah, that makes it nice. Yeah, just fine. Well, I guess we'd better forget about that income tax session tonight, huh? I guess so. Probably have to sit around all night hearing him yap about football. Makes me sick to think of it. I, you know, Jim, I've just been figuring if we don't make it tonight, I, I'm stuck. We can do it over the weekend, can't we? Well, I won't be back until Tuesday, and that's the 14th. I'll be up to my ears. Maybe you better get somebody else. Unless... Uh... Unless what? Well, uh, I was just thinking. You know, we could fix this guy, Charlie, but good. Oh? How do you mean? Well, I come over tonight, and we give it a big build-up. You know, I'm your tax counselor, take care of all your major investments, stuff like that, big business. Oh, I don't know, Hank. Why not? We don't have to prove anything. I know. It won't but... be as though you're doing the bragging. You're very modest about it. You even try to stop me a couple of times. I do, huh? Oh, sure. <laughs> you're 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 very embarrassed. You don't like the whole idea. But do I stop? I do not. I keep right on going. I lay it on thick. Even though I try to stop you. Sure. Charlie Warren thinks he's a big shot, huh? Well, we fix him. Anything he's got, you've got twice as many. Anything he's done, you've done twice as much. When I get through, I guarantee you'll sound like a combination of John D. Rockefeller and Fort Knox. Uh, you couldn't run in a little Ben Hogan or Sammy Sneed, could you? Jim, you're the greatest golfer since Bobby Jones. Yeah, a guy comes around, tries to bust up a happy home. Serve him right, wouldn't it? Certainly would. Well, no, heck, it wouldn't be right. Mm, okay, if you'd rather sit around and listen to him brag. Well, maybe if I... You think he will, huh? Jim, you don't know what they're like. When Charlie Warren gets through talking, you'll be lucky if you don't wind up living in the garage. I know, I've been through it. You have, huh? Sure. With me, it was a polo player. <laughs> Pretty rough, huh? Ah, I had to buy Elizabeth a fur coat before she'd even let me in the house. No. I don't know. A man tries to live an honest, decent life, and what happens? Just because he wasn't a football player, he doesn't amount to anything. Everybody's ashamed of him. How's about it, Jim? Do we give him the business? Well, all right. Let's do it. Okay. We'll teach him a lesson, won't we? You said it. Stick his nose in where it doesn't belong. Say, heck, uh, I don't know if Charlie was in the service, but... Well, if you'd like to put in a little uh, General MacArthur... Okay, General. Anchors away. Well, Father's planning to get a lot of pleasure out of showing up Charlie Warren. Maybe he will, and maybe he won't. You just can't tell about some things. Other things, though, you can count on for a world of pleasure every time. Coffee is one of them. Truly good coffee, I mean, like Maxwell House, with all that wonderful good-to-the-last-drop flavor. Morning, noon, and night, that famous flavor means so much more real enjoyment it really pays to remember Maxwell House is true economy. Yes, it pays to remember that in these days of higher prices. And a neighbor of ours could tell you why. The other day, she bought a cheaper coffee, thought it would be more economical. But the first time she served it, it tasted weak somehow. So she started adding more and more to the pot. But the flavor she expected just wasn't there, and cup after cup was left unfinished. That opened my eyes to something, she said. Maxwell House is true economy. Sure it is. Because every pound gives you so many more truly good cups of coffee. 
Just see how much more you enjoy that wonderful, good-to-the-last-drop flavor. The clear, rich taste. The roaster-fresh goodness vacuum-packed in that familiar blue tin. You'll know Maxwell House is true economy. Yes, for your money's worth and more, get Maxwell House coffee. Always good to the last drop. It's dinner time in the white frame house on Maple Street. The roast beef was wonderful. The cake was delicious. The coffee is sensational. And, strangely enough, the conversation isn't quite as belligerent as we thought it might be. Like this. How about another cup of coffee, Charlie? Well, thank you, Jim. That'll be fine. There you are. Thank you, Margaret. Well, holy cow, Mr. Warren. There certainly must be one football game you remember. Well, that was a long time ago. But if Mr. Warren doesn't want to talk about football, why don't you stop bothering him? But holy cow, Dad. I... Isn't that I don't want to talk about it, but it's just that, well, I haven't seen your mother and father in over 20 years. We've got a lot of other things to talk about, much more interesting things. Holy cow. Bud just can't get it into his head that there is anything more interesting than football. I can't either. <laughs> well, that's a fairly common thing when you're young. I used to feel the same way myself. Remember, Jim? Uh, yes, I certainly do. My whole life was wrapped up in football. I ate, drank, and slept football. Silliest character in Springfield. Mr. Warren, you weren't. But will you please stop arguing if Mr. Warren says... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, eat your cake and be quiet. Holy cow. You'll notice, Charlie, that Bud doesn't have anything to do with plain, ordinary cows. Just the holy ones. <laughs> yes, I'd notice. Oh, it's too bad Mrs. Warren couldn't make the trip with you, Charlie. Well, maybe the next time. Say, Jim, do you remember the night the old high school burned down? Oh, do I? I celebrated for three weeks. <laughs> Jim. Well, what I mean is, uh... <clears throat> Charlie, uh, remember how the principal, uh... What was his name? Mm. Baker, wasn't it? No, it was something like that, though. Baker, uh, Baylor. That was it. Old man Baylor. Yeah. Remember how he came flying down the street in his nightshirt? And all you could see were those long, skinny legs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mean that's better than football? <laughs> Bud, please be quiet. And don't say holy cow. Well, what can I say? Nothing. Gee whiz. <laughs> we'll talk about football the next time, bud. How'll that be? Okay. I don't know what gets into that boy. I swear I don't. Well, he's just a boy, Jim. Of course, I don't have any children, so... Don't you even have a little girl? No, Kathy, not even a little girl. Not even one? Not even one. Gee, that's awful. Kathy. Well, she's right, Jim. It is awful. I'd give anything for a family. Well, Charlie, make me a reasonable offer and you can have mine. <laughs> Father! It's all right, Betty. I know what he means. And I know what you mean to him. Yes, sir. Wonderful wife. Wonderful home. Three wonderful children. You're a lucky man, Jim. Well, you won't get any argument out of me on that. <laughs> I didn't think I would. But we sure used to have some pips, didn't we, Margaret? Oh. Long into the night, hour after hour. And if you want to know the real honest to goodness truth, Charlie, I married Jim just to stop the two of you from talking. <laughs> Mommy, you did? <laughs> Kathy, be quiet. That was a joke. It was? <laughs> <laughs> yes, those were the good old days, weren't they, Jim? Yes, sir, they certainly were. I sure wish we could have them back. I know one guy who would do things a lot differently. Oh, I don't know, Charlie. You led a pretty exciting life in school. Sure, big Charlie Warren, the campus idol. I didn't even know what time it was. You didn't? Gee, I'm only nine and I do. <laughs> Kathy. Kathy, will you please be quiet? I didn't say anything. Uh, what I meant, Kathy, was that I had some pretty strange ideas about what was important and what wasn't. I just couldn't think of anything but football. Well, gosh, what's wrong with that? Don't you like football? Oh, it's all right, bud, but not if you build your whole life around it. 
No, I'd have been a lot better off if I'd taken your dad's advice. You would? Well, Mr. Warren doesn't mean that... uh... Oh, it's true, Jim. Well, you're one of the most successful young executives in Springfield. That means more than a bunch of newspaper clippings and a couple of gold footballs. Jim, your mouth's open. Hmm? Oh, well, I, uh, uh... How long are you going to be in Springfield, Charlie? Just a few days, Jim. Well, you know, it's sort of silly, you staying downtown at the hotel... Why don't you move your things out here? You can take Bud's room Why, Jim No, I don't think so, Jim Where would Bud sleep? In the chandelier? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, uh, we'd, uh, we'd find a place for him I'll answer it, Dan Good grief, I forgot all about Hector Smith Excuse me, Mr. Warren Sure, go right ahead, Bud Charlie, you remember Hector Smith, don't you? Hector Smith? Mm. You mean the mathematical genius? That's the one. We're sure I remember him. Good old Heck. Well, he's supposed to help me with my income tax tonight, but... Well, go right ahead, Jim. After all, I run a pretty poor second to an income tax. (laughs) Well, 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 Charlie Warren, you old son of a gun. (laughs) Hector Smith, well, for gosh sakes. Well, how are you, Charlie? You haven't changed a bit. Oh, go on. I put on over 40 pounds. 40? <laughs> oh, you're kidding. Good evening, Hector. Oh, hello, Margaret. Hi, girls. Hello, Mr. Smith. Hi. We were just having a coffee, Heck. How about a cup for you? Well, you talked me into it. Hector, uh, about that thing we were talking about. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, what do you think of Jim, Charlie? He's done all right, huh? Hector, I was just telling him, Heck, he's made a wonderful place for himself in the world. Uh, you think so, huh? Well, you don't know the half of it. Hector. Now, isn't that just like a modest as the day is long? Can't stand to have people talk about his success. <laughs> Hector, will you forget about the whole thing, please? Well, you don't have to tell me about it, Heck. I'm as proud of him as you are. Then you ought to know the whole story. You've got no idea how successful he really is. Hector, please. Look at him, he's blushing. (laughs) And I don't blame him. A man who makes the kind of money he does. Hector, Charlie doesn't care anything about that. Well, sure he does, don't you, Charlie? Why, of course. You know... If Jim didn't have me to fix up his income tax return, why, he'd be paying for the last war all by himself. Father, would you really? Oh, Hector's exaggerating a little, Charlie. You know the way he is. Oh, now wait just a minute, Jim. You know, those little corners I cut, why, they save you a fortune. Nothing exactly crooked, you know. Just shave a little here. Shave a little there. (laughs) Throw in a haircut every once in a while. (laughs) Hector, please. Charlie, you may not believe this, but the money Jim makes on the golf course alone would take care of both of our salaries. Oh, no. (laughs) Well, as long as he declares it on his income tax return. That's what I mean. He'd like to, but why should he? Who knows about the $10,000 or $20,000 he picks up? Why, Jim? (laughs) Margaret, don't listen to him. You know the way I play golf. Yeah, yeah, you ought to see him, Charlie. It's a joke. You know, if he wanted to, he could beat Sammy Hogan every day of the week. (laughs) You mean Sammy Sneed? Yeah, yeah, that's what I said, yeah. But But he's too smart for that. He keeps just far enough ahead, sort of leads them on, and then when they're ripe for a big bet, Wham! He hits him with the works. For $20,000, huh? Oh, that's nothing. Hector, this is ridiculous. Will you please stop it? You see that car he's got outside? Mm-hmm. Just keeps it for sentimental reasons. Oh. Matter of fact, he told me just this morning he's going to buy a brand new Cadillac. Daddy! You know that $35,000 job they had in the magazines with the leopard skin upholstery? Father! And he's going to give that all heap to Bud. Holy cow. <laughs> Just to run around in. Hector, will you please drink your coffee? Hmm? Oh, hey, that's right. I forgot all about my coffee. Charlie, you know the way Hector is. Once he gets started with figures... Say, you... Charlie, did Jim tell you about the letter he got from General MacArthur? Hector! <laughs> Daddy! Did you get a letter from General MacArthur? No, Kathy, I didn't. I don't even know General MacArthur. 
How do you like that? MacArthur leans on him through the entire war, counts on him. <laughs> MacArthur depends on him, tells everybody that Jim Anderson won the war for us in the Pacific. And listen to him. Hector, I wasn't even in the Pacific. I was in Europe. You see, won the war in Europe, too. <laughs> and won't even admit it. Charlie. <laughs> oh, it's all right, Jim, I understand. He's proud of the fact that you fought overseas. I wish I could have been with you. Oh, you didn't go over, huh? No, I came up with an athletic heart. I'm awfully sorry, Charlie. We uh, didn't know. Oh, wait a minute, Jim. Nothing seriously wrong with me. I just couldn't get into active combat, that's all. I wound up pounding a desk in Washington. Oh, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, it worked out fine for me. That's where I met my wife. That's how I got my job. Say, Charlie, what are you doing these days? Well, I thought you knew, Hector. I'm with the government. Income tax division. <laughs> to convince Hector and father of one thing. It always pays to do some investigating before you act. Sure, it pays to know all the facts. And here's another case in point. There's so much more pure pleasure in truly good coffee, it's important to remember this fact. Maxwell House is true economy. Yes, Maxwell House is true economy. Now, you can find cheaper coffees in the store, but will you find economy in them? Not when you add more and more coffee to the pot, yet still can't get the flavor you want. Not when coffee is so lacking in flavor your family leaves their cups unfinished. No, you can't call that economy. But Maxwell House is true economy. So many more truly good cups of coffee in every pound. Such extra richness and flavor. So good to the last drop, you drink every drop. Yes, there's real reason why more people drink Maxwell House than any other brand at any price. Maxwell House is true economy. Tomorrow, get your money's worth and more with Maxwell House coffee. Always good to the last drop. Now it's breakfast time again in the white frame house on Maple Street. It's a pleasant day, not too warm and not too cool. A very pleasant day indeed. For everyone but Father, thusly. But you said the government gave you $600 on account of me. So why can't you raise my allowance? Kathy, I didn't say they gave me $600. They allow me to deduct it from my income tax. $600. And all I get is 35 cents a week. <laughs> what are you kicking about? One minute I've got a car and the next minute I haven't. <laughs> After I already told Joe Phillips. Well, you had no right to tell him, dear. You knew that Mr. Smith was only joking. Some joke. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Mother, isn't Mr. Warren the sweetest man? Yes, dear, he's very nice. Uh, I'll tell you one thing. He's certainly changed. Well, somebody has. Bud. Never mind. I'm almost through with my breakfast. All right, Kathy. Stop playing with your milk. Can't I even blow bubbles? Hello? Oh, hello, Heck. No, I was just finishing my breakfast. This afternoon? All right, let's say about three o'clock. Okay. Say, wait a minute, Heck. I thought you were going out of town. Oh, I see. Yeah, all right, Heck. Three o'clock. See you later. Is there anything wrong, dear? No, it was just Hector. Oh, I thought he was going out of town. He was, but, well, he's decided he'd better spend the next few days revising his own income tax. <laughs> If you like good things the easy way Good things the easy way Instant Maxwell House, that's for you Good, good coffee that's easy too No time, no trouble No grounds, no pot And it's good to the very last You, you know, know what? Yes, Instant Maxwell House means great coffee instantly in your cup. Here's real instant coffee. All pure Maxwell House coffee in instant form. <laughs> 
Enjoy instant Maxwell House. Instantly. Good to the very last. You know what? Join us again next week when we'll be back with Father Knows Best, starring Robert Young as Jim Anderson, with Roy Bargey and the Maxwell House Orchestra, and yours truly, Bill Foreman. Don't forget, membership cards for the Robert Young Good Drivers Club are waiting for you at your local NBC station. Get a man-to-man or dad-to-daughter pledge and sign up today. Be a good driver. Get your membership card in the Robert Young Good Drivers Club today. Now until next Thursday, good night and good luck from the makers of Maxwell House, America's favorite brand of coffee, always good to the last drop. Father Knows Best was transcribed in Hollywood and written by Ed James. Now stay tuned in for Screen Guild Theater, which follows immediately over most of these stations. It's Screen Guild Theater with The Foreign Affair, next on NBC. Mother, is Maxwell House really the only coffee in the world? Well, your father says so, and your father knows best. Yes, it's Father Knows Best, transcribed in Hollywood, starring Robert Young as father. A half-hour visit with your neighbors, the Andersons, brought to you by America's favorite coffee, Maxwell House. The coffee that's always good to the last drop. A decade or so before the turn of the 20th century, the city editor of the New York Sun came up with a remarkably simple definition of news. When a dog bites a man, he said, that is not news because it happens so often. But if a man bites a dog, that is news. Well, in Springfield in the white frame house on Maple Street, news may very well be in the making. Nothing unusual has happened thus far, but it's quite possible that before the week is out, A man named Anderson will bite a dog, like this. Holy cow, Dad, I couldn't help it. Bud, when you signed the good driving pledge... But I wasn't even driving, Dad. The car was just sitting there. And the fender dropped off all by itself. Sure. Bud, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But it's true, Dad. I wouldn't be surprised if the whole car fell apart. Is that so? There's nothing wrong with the car, and you know it. Daddy... What is it, Kathy? Did you know that in the polar regions, dogs are the chief means of transportation? What's that got to do with Bud knocking a fender off the car? I didn't knock it off, Dad. It fell off. Bud, unless you're willing to tell me the truth... Jim, Bud is not in the habit of telling lies, and if he says the fender fell off, then it fell off. And we put it back on again with wire, Dad. You'd never even know the difference. Oh, fine. (laughs) Bud, if I ever find out... Oh, never mind. May I have my coffee, Margaret? Of course, dear. Here you are. Thank you. Nothing. What? It doesn't have anything to do with Bud knocking a fender off the car. I did not. Wait a minute, Bud. Kathy, what doesn't have anything to do with Bud knocking a fender off the car? Dogs are the chief means of transportation in the polar regions. Fine. I'll order a dog sled in the morning. (laughs) Is that what you want? Oh, no. I just wanted to tell you. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. (laughs) Silliest thing I've ever heard in my life. That car's practically as good as it was the day we bought it. Might need a little paint here and there. Daddy. What is it, Kathy? Did you know that the dog has been chosen as the companion of man because of his fidelity and intelligence? Well, I'd heard rumors. But it's nice to have it on such complete authority. You're welcome. (laughs) Dad. Yes, bud? Does that mean that I can't have the car on Thursday anymore? No, I suppose it'll be all right. But in the future, I wish you'd be a little more careful, that's all. 
I wouldn't be surprised if the roof caved in. Betty, what's gotten into you? Until tonight, the only complaint you ever had about the car was that you didn't get it often enough. Jim. Yes, Margaret? The Liggetts have a new car. A convertible. Oh. Well, pardon me. Dogs are bred for sports, as watchdogs, for guarding and driving sheep, and for plain ordinary dogs. Kathy, deep in your obscure little mind... I'll see you it is. You stay right where you are. I wanted to get to the bottom of this dissertation on dogs. Bud? Yes, Stan? See who's at the door. Holy cow. You <laughs> think nobody else around here knew how to open a door. All right, Kathy. Will you explain something to me as simply as possible? Why this sudden interest in the history of our canine companions? Huh? Dogs. Oh, well, dogs are pets, and everybody says they're man's best friend, and they'd probably be girls' best friends, too, and I don't see why... Kathy, are you going to start that dog business again? But everybody I know has a dog, and I don't see why... You know as well as I that Betty's allergic to dogs. They make her sneeze. Dad, it's Mr. Davis. Oh, come on in, Ed. Hello, Jim, Margaret. Hello, Ed. Hello, girls. Hello, Mr. Davis. We're just finishing our dinner, Ed. How about a cup of coffee? Oh, no, thanks, Jim. I, Well, I just want to talk to you about your dog. Our what? Well, I wouldn't mind if it were just an ordinary rose bush, Jim, but this was a Bengal, a genuine hibiscus rosa sinensis. Ed. I only had to, and you ought to see the one he dug up. It's a complete wreck. Ed. Yes, Jim. What dog? Why, your dog. We don't have a dog. You know that. Daddy. Jim. <laughs> I dislike this whole thing as much as you do, but that bush cost me $13. Ed, we don't have a dog. Daddy. And I, I wouldn't even know where to get another one. They only had two in town. I bought both of them. Ed. Yes, Jim. We don't have a dog. Daddy! Kathy, I'm talking to Mr. Davis. I know, Daddy, but I want to tell you something. All right, what is it? We have a dog. <laughs> Fine. Look, Ed, I know how you must feel, but... We what? Kathy, you're joking. What do you mean, we have a dog? Well, it was such a poor little dog, Daddy, and it kept following me and following me and... Kathy, you mean we have a dog... Here? Uh-huh. Uh, 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 <laughs> Betty, stop that. I can't stop it, Father. You certainly can. Kathy, you've been told a thousand times not to bring a dog into the house. Uh, uh, <laughs> She's just doing that to be mean. I am done. <laughs> she wasn't sneezing before, and the dog was here all the time. Where? What? Where is it? Where's what? The dog. Oh, the dog. <laughs> Kathy, where did you put the dog? In the playroom. Well, we'll just see about that. Of course, it isn't the most valuable rose bush in the world, Jim, but if you knew the trouble I'd gone through... Jim, well, where are you going? Down to the playroom. Oh, Daddy, please don't be mean to the little dog. He wouldn't hurt a fly. Where do you think you're going, bud? Well, can I come with you? Gosh, I just want to look at it. I didn't mean to start all this trouble, Jim, but after all, he did dig up the rose bush. I know, Ed. I'll be very glad to pay for it as soon as we... Oh. <laughs> My aching back. Look at the size of that thing. Just wait for you upstairs, Jim. <laughs> Kathy, that isn't a dog. It's a werewolf. <laughs> no, it isn't, Daddy. It's a dog, and you're frightening him. I'm frightening him. <laughs> Poor little fella. We're not going to hurt you. Kathy, get away from him. But, Daddy... You heard me, Kathy. <laughs> you don't get away from that dog... Well, stay over there if that's what he wants. But don't get too close. Jim, Ed Davis said there was a lion in the basement. Did you... 
Oh, Kathy! Isn't he cute, Mommy? Kathy, come over here. You, uh, you better do as your mother says, Kathy. <laughs> Maybe she better do what the dog says. <laughs> Jim, what are we going to do? We're going to find out where he belongs and get rid of him. That's what we're going to do. Oh, Daddy, you can't. He's such a beautiful dog, and he's so easy to feed. All he eats is cookies. <coughs> Bud. <laughs> uh, see what the tag says on his collar. On his collar? Me? <laughs> oh, he won't hurt you, Bud. Will you, George? Well, go ahead, Bud. There's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, that's a nice fella. <laughs> nice, George. Well, his name isn't exactly George, bud. I just call him that. Oh, you're a great help. <laughs> nice boy. <laughs> that's a nice boy. Atta boy. Uh, what does it say, bud? Gargantua the <laughs> third. <laughs> oh, that's how you say it. Property of Michael Reed, Orchard Avenue. Orchard Avenue? Well, that's a mile away. How did he get clear over here? I think he walked. <laughs> well, he can walk right back. Bud, call Mr. Reed and tell him we have his dog. Oh, Daddy, no! Oh, Daddy, yes! <laughs> Kathleen, it isn't our dog, and we've got to send him back home. But, Mommy, mm. I love him so. <laughs> <laughs> Don't cry, Kathy. Gosh, you've still got us. Everybody's got somebody. And all I have is you. You want me to answer it, Dad? No, never mind. I'm right here. Mr. Anderson? Yes? I'm Mr. Reed's chauffeur. Oh, yes. Come on right in. Oh, thank you. Very nice of you to go to all this trouble. Oh, it's no trouble at all. Mr. Reed was quite concerned about Gargantua, quite concerned. Well, we uh, weren't too happy about him ourselves. Uh, Kathy? You want me, Daddy? The man is here for the dog. Gee whiz. She'll have it up here in just a minute. Uh, Peculiar-looking animal, isn't it? Oh, no. It's a very valuable dog. Vimarana. A vi... You don't say. <laughs> yes, it's a German hunting dog. Very intelligent. Well, that's a matter of opinion. Kathy, will you please hurry? Daddy, I can't find him. You what? Oh, Daddy, the most terrible thing happened. He got away. Kathy. But he did, Daddy. I just opened the door, and he was gone. You uh, didn't happen to give him a push. Oh, Daddy, how can you say... Well, maybe one little push. <laughs> now, see here, Kathleen. Oh, you don't have to worry, Daddy. I think I can find him again later. I, uh, I'm awfully sorry about this. I understand. Oh, hello, Ed. Oh, Jim, I don't like Ed, to... Ed, please, I told you I'd get you another rose bush, and I will. First thing in the morning. I know, Jim, but after all... Now... George got away. Yes, I know he got away. Only he didn't get far enough away. Have you seen him? Yes, I've seen him. He's in my backyard, and he's having a wonderful time. All right, Kathy, go get him. Gee whiz. And Jim. Yes? When you get that hibiscus sinensis tomorrow, make it two. Oh, no. <laughs> Across the country, there's good news about coffee these days. Grocers everywhere are featuring Maxwell House at lower prices. That's right. These days, the coffee with that wonderful good-to-the-last-drop flavor comes to you at the lowest prices in months. A mighty welcome occasion for everybody. You, your grocer, yes, and for Maxwell House, too. 
With Maxwell House Coffee, we've always aimed at one thing, to bring you the best in coffee at the lowest possible price. And that's meant a lot. Meant you could always count on more flavor for your money in every cup of Maxwell House, more wonderfully good cups of coffee in every pound. It's the reason why, year after year, folks everywhere have found Maxwell House is true economy. And nowadays, Maxwell House is more than ever today's coffee buy. The world's most famous coffee flavor is yours to enjoy every cup you pour. And the price is the lowest in months. So tomorrow, get your money's worth and more. Bring home a familiar blue tin of Maxwell House and start enjoying coffee that's always good to the last drop. The dog is a creature whose principal feature is love And there's nothing can daunt him He'll stay by your side as though he were tied Especially if you don't want it A few days have gone by And in Springfield we find a most unhappy individual Between roses which cannot be found And a dog which refuses to get lost Jim Anderson's lot is a miserable one indeed, like this. Go on, get away. <laughs> oh, isn't he cute, Daddy? He wants to play. Well, tell him to play with something else. But he likes you, Daddy. All right, I like him, but you don't see me biting his shoes. <laughs> oh, he just wants to be friendly. No good fender. Why don't they make the bolts big enough? They don't want you to fix your car, that's what. Expect you to buy a new one every five minutes. Daddy. What is it, Kathy? George is hungry. George is hungry. George is sleepy. George, George, George. Kathy. Yes, Daddy? How many times have you found that dog? Six. And how many times have we sent him home? Six. Most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Any dog that's stupid enough to get trapped in back of a fence six times in a row... Hi, Jim. Oh, Ed, come on over here. I've got good news for you. Okay. Hey, see, George is back again. Yeah, idiotic animal. Comes clear over here from Orchard Avenue and then gets stuck in back of the Willoughby Spence. <laughs> smart dog. He is smart, Daddy. He knows that's where I meet him. Well, why don't you leave him there? Let somebody else find him for a change. But, Daddy, the Willoughby's moved away. There wouldn't be anybody to feed him. He can always eat rose bushes. Oh, that's what I wanted to tell you, Ed. There they are. You mean those? Yep, two Bengals, and I had to go clear to Plainfield to get them. Jim, I don't like to be difficult, but those aren't Bengals. They most certainly are. Look at the tags. Hmm. Well, they're uh, marked Bengals, all right, but... Oh, well, you see, Jim, there are two kinds of Bengals. A hibiscus rosa sinensis and rosa japanicus. Now, mine were hibiscus sinensis, and they're a much hardier variety. Ed, a rose is a rose. <laughs> and you said Bengals. I don't like to argue, Jim, but I said hibiscus sinensis. You see, the Japanicus is very susceptible to mildew and thrips. That's bad, huh? Oh, yeah, especially around here. The Japanicus doesn't do well in Springfield at all. It needs a much milder climate. I see. You, uh... You wouldn't consider moving. <laughs> Nothing. I... I'll keep looking, Ed. After all, what's a few more days? I wouldn't be able to do anything but work anyway. Uh, Mr. Anderson? Oh, hello there. We're back here near the garage. Mr. Anderson, I don't know what to say. Mr. Reed is most apologetic. Yes, I'm sure he must be. Well, I'll be getting back to my gardening. I've got another bit of geraniums to set up. I'm sorry they weren't the right ones, Ed. Oh, well, that's all right, Jim. There's no particular hurry. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Mr. Anderson, I want to assure you that we've done everything in our power to keep Gargantua at home. I'm sure you have. I've gone over the fence with a fine-tooth comb. We've fixed everything, and still he gets out. Maybe the fence isn't high enough. Well, it's quite high, but we're going to make it higher. And now if I may have the dog... Yes, Kathy. Now, where the dickens did she go? Kathy! You want me, Daddy? Where's George? George? No, we call him George. Kathy? I'm coming, Daddy. Maybe if you called him George, he'd stay home. Well, it might be a little confusing, but we'll try. Kathy, why is it... What happened to George? I don't know, Daddy. Isn't he with you? 
No, he isn't with me. <laughs> Where'd he go? I don't know. Kathy, why is it that every time Mr. Reed's chauffeur... George. Thank you. Every time George shows up, George... <laughs> George? Yes, sir. George. Oh. Well, why is it every time George shows up, jo uh, the dog disappears? I don't know. What do you know? I don't know. I'm sorry, George, but George, uh, gargantua... <laughs> George! Jim! Ed, is George over there? He certainly is, and I'm very slowly reaching a point where I don't think it's at all funny. Ed, he didn't tear up another rose bush. No. Well, thank goodness. This time he got the geraniums. <laughs> George dug up the geraniums? No, but I made a bed, and he's lying in it. <laughs> $35 for two miserable little rose bushes. It's criminal, that's what it is. Jim, let's just be thankful that we were able to find them. Hibiscus sinensis. Margaret, if I ever see that dog again, so help me. Jim. I'll... What's the matter? He's back. Oh, no. He can't be. Well, stop the car, Jim. We've got to get him. Why? Why can't we just pretend that we've never met George? That we've never even heard of him? Dear, we owe it to Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed. He's the one who ought to pay for the roses. George is his dog. Jim, that's not being very charitable. Well, I don't feel very charitable. Where is he? Back of the Willoughby's fence. Again? Margaret, that's the stupidest animal I've ever seen in my life. This is the eighth time he's been stuck in the Willoughby's yard. Any dog with half a brain knows you can jump both ways over a fence. Come here, you silly mongrel. Oh, Jim, isn't that sweet? He knows us. Well, why shouldn't he know us? He's been boarding with us for almost a week. Come on, George. That's a good boy. Take his collar, Jim. I'd like to wring his neck. Come on, George. Jim, I don't think you're being very nice to him. Well, I don't think he's being very nice to us. George, will you please make up your mind... You want to come home with us, or are you going to stay here? Daddy! Oh, Daddy, you found him again! Oh, George, I'm so happy to see you. Oh, my wonderful George. Kathy, nice drag guy. that animal over to our house. Oh, you don't have to drag him, Daddy. Well, get him over there. And this time, hang on to him. Okay, Daddy. Come on, George, I'll race you to the garage. <laughs> Man's best friend. Intelligent and loyal. A half-witted caterpillar has more intelligence than that George. Jim, how about the car? I'll come back for it later. Right now, I'm going to call that Reed guy and give him a piece of my mind. That's what I'm going to do. If he can't learn to take better care of a dog, he doesn't have any business owning one. Jim, I'm sure Mr. Reed is doing everything he can. Well, it isn't enough. Owning a dog is a responsibility to the dog and the neighborhood and everybody else. Let a dog run wild that way, first thing you know, he'll be hit by a car. He's liable to be killed. I thought you didn't like George. I don't. I mean, well, he's all right, I guess, but they have no business letting him run around the way they do. Jim, please don't be too abrupt. Mr. Reed is just as concerned about George as we are. Well, why shouldn't he be? It's his dog. Hello? Oh, this is Jim Anderson. Yes, he's here again. And look, George, I think it's high time... Well, okay. He's coming right over. Jim, when he gets here, please remember that George isn't responsible for George. After all, he's merely the chauffeur. Which one? George. Oh. He told me this morning that Mr. Reed was going to have the entire fence made higher, and if Mr. Reed thinks that much of George... Now, just a minute, Margaret. Bud! You want me, Dad? Go outside and hang on to George. Okay. Betty! Are you in your room? Yes, Father. Well, look out the window and keep an eye on George. Okay. He won't get away this time if I can help it. Now, uh, what were you saying, Margaret? Well, I merely said that if Mr. Reed thought that much of George... Be gods, now what? I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Anderson. Well, you should be. Anybody who can't take better care of a nice dog like George... We do take care of him, Mr. Anderson. We still can't understand how he gets away. 
That's a very poor excuse. How would you feel if I... Wait a minute. How did you get over here so fast? Well, I left the moment I hung up. I know, but from clear over on Orchard Avenue... Oh, we haven't lived on Orchard Avenue for almost a week. We moved into the Willoughby house on the corner. Oh, no. <laughs> When you go grocery shopping this weekend, be sure to see the welcome news about coffee in your store. These days, grocers everywhere are featuring Maxwell House coffee at lower prices. Now, all of you who know and love that wonderful good-to-the-last-drop flavor can enjoy it at the lowest price in months. And for you folks who haven't been getting that famous flavor, now's the time to bring home a familiar blue Maxwell House tin. Find out how much more satisfaction, more real pleasure it holds for you. Cup after cup, day after day, you can always count on that Maxwell House flavor. For we'll never compromise on the quality of a single pound. Tomorrow, look for Maxwell House at the lowest prices in months. Now more than ever, today's coffee buy. Get your money's worth and more with coffee that's always good to the last drop. Another day has come and gone, and so has the perennial George. There's peace once more in the Anderson household. But we wonder just how long it will last. It never does, does it? Like this. Most ridiculous thing that ever happened in my whole life. Stealing a dog out of his own yard. They could have had us arrested. Father. Yes, Betty? Have you noticed how quiet it's gotten around here? I certainly have. Nice and quiet. How was I supposed to know anybody'd moved in? Why didn't they put up curtains or something? That George is a pretty smart dog. And what a character. You know what he did yesterday? Whatever he did, I'm not going to pay for it. Oh, it wasn't anything like that, Dad. Kathy taught him how to play hide-and-seek. And he was really hiding. Good. I hope it's years before anybody finds him. <laughs> Why, Jim, you know you miss George as much as any of us. I do? I miss George? Huh. <laughs> Margaret, this is the first peaceful moment I've had in almost a week. Daddy! 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 Kathy, what is it? What's wrong? Oh, Daddy, the most beautiful thing happened. Mr. Reed gave me a reward. Why, how nice, Kathy. Oh, I'm so excited. Well, it was certainly the least he could do. What was the reward, Kathy? I can borrow George any time I please. No. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? Here, George! <laughs> Oh, my beautiful George. Hiya, oh, boy. Ha, 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 Hello, George. yours to enjoy an instant coffee you'll love for breakfast every morning. An instant coffee you'll be proud to serve to your dinner guests. It's Instant Maxwell House, the instant coffee with a famous flavor. Here's the happiest combination in coffee. Wonderful good to the last drop flavor combined with the convenience and thrift of coffee made instantly in the cup. Tomorrow, try Instant Maxwell House, the instant coffee with a famous flavor. Instantly good to the last drop. <laughs> In lands across the seas, many people still lack the simplest necessities of life. Food is inadequate, clothing scarce. Help is needed from each of us who can send it. The time to send that help is now. The way to send it is through CARE, C-A-R-E. For this is National Care Week, and Americans everywhere are joining in sending food and clothing abroad. To send a 24-pound package, mail $10 to CARE, New York. That's $10 to CARE, New York. Enclose your name and address and the address of the recipient. Delivery is guaranteed. Join in National Care Week now.
Join us again next week when we'll be back with Father Knows Best, starring Robert Young as Jim Anderson, with Roy Bargey and the Maxwell House Orchestra, and yours truly, Bill Foreman. Don't forget, membership cards for the Robert Young Good Drivers Club are waiting for you at your local NBC station. Get a man-to-man or dad-to-daughter pledge and sign up today. Be a good driver. Get your membership card in the Robert Young Good Drivers Club today. Now until next Thursday, good night and good luck from the makers of Maxwell House, America's favorite brand of coffee. Always good to the last drop. Father Knows Best was transcribed in Hollywood and written by Ed James. Now stay tuned in for Screen Guild Theater, which follows immediately over most of these stations. Stay tuned for Charles Boyer and Olivia de Havilland on NBC.